Hello, welcome to our June 24th, 2020 meeting. Before the formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council, the Assisted Housing Governing Board will convene. I will begin by calling to order the meeting of the Assisted Housing Governing Board. Will the City Clerk please call the roll? Board Member DeCicio? Here. Board Member Garcia? Here. Board Member Nowakowski? Board Member Pastor? Here. Board Member Stark? Here. Board Member Waring? Here. Board Member Wiesahan? Here. I don't know. Board Member Wiesen. Here. Thank you. Vice Chair Guardado. Here. Chairwoman Gallego. Here. Thank you. Thank you all for joining us. We begin with the resolution adopting the Phoenix Public Housing Authority proposed asset management budget for fiscal year 2020-2021. Do we have a motion? Mayor. Motion to approve the resolution. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. DeCicio. Here. Garcia. Here. Nowakowski. Pastor. Here. Stark. Yes. Waring. Here. Lisa Ham. Here. Guardado. Here. Yes. Thank you. Gallego. Yes. Motion passes 8-0. We next move to item number four. Do we have a motion to approve that resolution? Motion to approve the resolution. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Pastor? Pastor? I'm having difficulty unmuting here. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Weasel hand? Yes. Williams? Yes, there's a lot of static when you talk. Thank you, Councilwoman Williams. Yes, there's some background noise. Weasel hand? I apologize, Wiesa Han. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes seven to one. Thank you. We then move to item number five. Do we have a motion to approve that resolution? I'm motion. To, I'm, motion to approve the resolution. Second. Any discussion? Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Pa Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. 
Weeza hand. Yes. Weeza hand. Are you saying Williams? Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Councilwoman Williams. Yes, we have you and we have Board Member Weeza hand. Guardado? Yes. 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 Gallego? Yes. Passes eight to one. Wonderful, thank you. An exciting vote uh, with our great partnership with Native American Connections and redevelopment of Deck Park Vistas. With that, we have concluded the business of the Assisted Housing Governing Board. And we adjourn. Done. Thank you to board member, our board member for joining us. We will now call to order the formal meeting of the Phoenix City Council for June 24th, 2020. Roll call. Councilman DeCicio. Here. Councilmember Garcia. Here. Councilman Nowakowski. Councilwoman Pastor. Here. Councilwoman Stark. Here. Councilman Waring. Here. Councilwoman Williams. Here. Vice Mayor Guardado. Here. Mayor Gallego. Here. Mayor Gallego. We have an interpreter here, Mario Barajas, to assist uh, individuals. Mayor, I'm here also. Thank you, Councilman Nowakowski. We will ask. Sorry about that. We think it's going to be a rough sound day. We're, we're uh, starting off with some static. But we can only go up from here. Can the city clerk please read the 24-hour paragraph? The titles of the following ordinance and resolution numbers on the agenda were available to the public at least 24 hours prior to this council meeting and therefore may be read by title or agenda item only. Ordinances number G6703 and 6708 through 6714, S46778 through 46819, and resolutions 21838 through 21844. Thank you. Vice Mayor, do you have a motion on the meeting minutes from June 26, 2019? Yes, I would like to make a motion to approve the minutes from June 26, 2019. Second. All those in favor, please signal aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Councilman DeCicio, do you have a motion on the meeting minutes from July 3rd of 2019? I uh, move their approval, Mayor. Thank okay. you. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on Mayor and City Council Board and Commission nominations? Yes, we have a motion to approve Mayor and City Council Boards and Commissions nomination. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on our liquor license applications? Yes, we have motion to approve items four through five. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes unanimously. City Clerk, are we ready for ordinances, resolutions, new business, planning, and zoning? Yes, Mayor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, we have a motion to approve items 6 through 89, except the following items 16 through 20, 33, 35, 36, 60, and 61. Items 62 and 89 have been withdrawn. Items 29, items 29 is requested to be continued to July 1st, 2020. And item 88 is requested to be continued to September 2nd, 2020. Item 87 is as revised and excluding these items for public comment, 7, 8, 9, 10, 34, 60, 64, 82, 84, 85, 86, 
in 87. Second. Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Uh, Mayor, I want to explain my vote. Um, you didn't pull 43 out, right? No, Mayor. All right. I just want to make sure that um, the selling of this property that um, for the uh, development of a senior center near um, the Cesar Chavez Community Center is still a part of this um, motion, which is stated in this document. So I'll be voting yes as long as it's stated that way. It is. All right. Thank you. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. 9-0. We next move to item number sec, uh, seven, microception. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve item seven. Second. Uh, we have one member of the public to address the council on the topic of microception. Marcus Reed. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Right. Um, so, not that I'm against uh, a police ca accountability, um, personally, uh, but I am inquisitive about the language in the agenda report. Um, that is, uh, it says, protect the police from unnecessary liability. Uh, that in itself shows that PLEA has too much control over the misconduct of the police officers in our community. We are desperately in need of a more viable way to prevent all all in any way of uh, deviant behavior from our police department. The citizens are aware of the misdeeds and the spin the PR department is putting on the so-called bad apples to help them out. Um, and so I would just really like, um, um, you know, more so the, uh, the focus on PLEA and not, uh, you know, the uh, video recording of, of, of these, uh, uh, reviews. Um, but I do want to yield the rest of the time for a moment of silence for the brave first line medical care staff that are putting their lives on the line and not being recognized as, as people uh, that we need to protect from, from COVID. Thank you for your testimony. Any council member comments on item number seven? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Castor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-0. We next move to item number eight, instant armor. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, we have a motion to approve item eight. Second. Uh, Marcus had also asked to comment on this. Uh, Marcus, did you have additional comments to provide? Yeah, I'm not uh, so I actually have a question, more or less. Um, so is this additional to the $25 million that uh, was approved last week? Thank you for your comment. Council member comments. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. 
Nowakowski, Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. This Passes. is Nowakowski. I'm a yes. Thank you, Councilman Nowakowski. Passes 9 0. Thank you. We next move to item number nine safe haven for the purchase of windshields. Do we have a motion? Yes, motion to approve item nine. Second. Um, Marcus has a comment on this one as well. Mr. Reed. Mayor, he's no longer on the line. Um, wonderful. Would, uh, Okay. Um, any council member comments? Roll call. DeCicio. Yeah. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Waring? Yes. I'm sorry, you guys did. Yes? Can you guys hear me? Yes, thank you, Councilman Waring oh. and Councilwoman Williams. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. Uh, we next move to item 10, first two ink. Do we have a motion? Motion to approve item 10. Second. Uh, any council member comments? Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9 0. Thank you. Items 16 through 20 are annual payments related to our water department. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on items 16 through 20? Well, before I make the motion, I just wanted to make sure that Councilmember DeCicio was okay with us bundling them all up together. Uh, yes, that's well, perfectly. Actually, oh, go ahead, Mayor. Sorry. No, Council Member DeCisa, that's great. Um, yes. Well, Was that yes? May Mayor, this is Jim, no. Uh, that, oh. I, wanted to, I wanted to vote yes on 16. Wonderful. A Can responsible we? decision. We will, Vice Mayor, do you have a motion on item 16? Thank yes, you, I have a motion, motion, motion to approve item 16. Second. We have a motion and a second. Item 16 is our membership in the Municipal Water Users Association where Councilwoman Williams serves us with great skill. Uh, any council member comments on AMWA? Is this just 16 we're voting on, Mayor, or is it uh, the whole This is the only 16, other one? yes. Okay, well, I'll just, you know, I'll just give one quick comment on all of them from 16 through 20. These represent about $800,000 in membership dues. And those are considerable when we look at rate increases and we think about it. And the question is, is whether or not we really need to have these membership dues. And I just have real problems with that. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Councilwoman Williams, thank you so much for your service on AMWA. Well, thank you. Uh, I just want to say I know that uh, this is a large amount of money, but each one of those memberships uh, is important to the city of Phoenix. It pertains to not only local, state, but federal water issues, protecting our resources, making sure that we continue to have ample water supplies in a fair distributed manner. 
So they really serve a purpose. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Roll call. Decisio? No. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Waring? Yes. I'm sorry you guys can't hear me, but. Thank you. I we did this time. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 8 1. Thank you. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion on items 17 through 20? Yes, we have a motion to approve items 17 through 20. Second. Council Member comments? Roll call. Decisio? No. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes seven to two. Thank you. Item uh, 33 is a contract with Community Legal Services. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, we have a motion to approve item 33. Okay. We have a motion okay. and a second. Uh, this item is related to uh, providing legal aid folks facing housing challenges, including eviction. Very important during this time of an eviction moratorium and when it is lifted in a few short weeks. Um, Councilman, uh, do any council members have comments on this? Yeah, Mayor, I just got a couple quick questions of staff. Wonderful, Councilmember DeCicio. Thank you. Uh, staff, because uh, I can't see who's there, but the, the question I've got, it's about $800,000. Why are we just not using that? These are COVID dollars. Why are we not using that just to pay off their mortgages? rather than go through the whole legal issue. I don't get it. Uh, the $800,000 would go a long ways for individuals to pay them. That's what it's designed for. And if people have, if this is, co and it has to be COVID related, correct? Those are the two questions first. Good afternoon, Mayor Gallego and Councilman DeCicio. This is Marcelle Franklin, the Human Services Director. To answer your first your sure. second question, hi, how are you? To answer your second question, yes, it has to be COVID related. To answer your first question, oftentimes individuals who are having to go to justice court related to evictions uh, may not necessarily be related, related to not paying rent. It could be, for example, um, you know, the air conditioning is not working and in the midst of COVID, they're needing to go other places, so they may choose the renter to break or lease or not pay their rent, if you will. And so there can be legal rights that are available to that individual that he or she may not be aware of, that community legal services being able to have the legal background to articulate to those individuals, here are your rights. So it's not only relative to uh, evictions, it could be other things regarding landlord-tenant laws that community legal services would be responsible for. Of course, understanding that any of the services have to be tied to a COVID related need. So the question I've got too on the, uh, it's approximately $800,000. Is that based on the hourly that they're going to be doing or is it just based, is it a budget related or tell me what that is? Is it a blank number? Mayor Gallego and Councilman DeCicio, it is a blank number. We are not sure necessarily how many individuals will come through our justice courts. We do know, however, from talking with 
those in the community who work in this area. We continue to see and experience concerns with individuals not having appropriate legal representation when they do have to go to court for these types of issues. Oftentimes, the landlords will have legal representation, but the tenants do not. I understand that part. I'm talking more about the financial end because whenever we pay our attorneys, it's based on a contracted amount, but they have to do X amount of hours. They could do one hour, and then that's what they get paid for, or they get, you know, they do 100 hours and they get paid X amount for that. My understanding is that this is not designed that way. It's just a lump sum. And how do we keep track of how many hours the attorneys have paid uh, put into the deal? And how many, and how do we track the actual individuals that they were supposed to have helped? So Mayor Gallego, Councilman DeCicio, it is based upon a flat rate. However, community and legal services is required as a part of our contract to be able to demonstrate to us the number of individuals that are served as well as ensuring that it is COVID related. And what is the rate? Council, Mayor Gallego and Councilman DeCicio, it is just a flat rate no, I don't understand, I, but what is the rate? I mean, what is it the rate that they're charging per hour? We'll find that out. Uh, Mayor Gallego and Councilman DeCicio, I don't have that specific information in front of me. Uh, I, can, I can try and locate that in the next few minutes. I just don't happen to have it right in front of me, so I apologize. <laughs> no, it's just unusual for us to do a lump sum like this because I've not seen that. And usually you have a budget, but they have to do X amount of hours in that budget to do that. At least the way I'm seeing this, they could do one case and it's 800,000. They could be, or they could do 1,000 cases. Uh, Mayor Councilman DeCicio, the, the 800,000 is, is an authorization of an estimate for some number of cases that they actually have to perform in order to draw against that number. So we're not writing them a check up front for 800,000. Uh, they, they have to demonstrate per case in order to use that money fully? Well, you're either doing it by, by, by hourly or by case. Uh, I'm sorry, I must so I, I one misspoke. Of those, you, yeah, I misspoke. I, I, go ahead. We're gonna check and see if it's per case or per hour. Ms. Franklin will find out. I would out. assume it's per hour, right. I, I think that's correct, but we're gonna double check. It's just the way it's worded. It just looks like it's a lump sum amount without any accountability as into the, you know, number of cases or anything. It's an authorization for an up to amount based on an estimate since we haven't completed it yet. Um, so that, that's why it is written in that way. Mr. Oh, okay. Did you have something more? Okay. But you still want you know, just the hourly is all I need to know. We're checking on that. Okay, that's fine. Mayor, do we want to come back to item 33 to get that information or um, we, we can we can come back with that information here in just a minute. Um, Councilman DeCicio, would you be comfortable moving forward and you could vote no as you did at policy, I yeah, suspect? As long, yes, as long as they put whatever the number is on the record before the end of the meeting. Wonderful, there are many CARES Act ones where it would be appropriate to have that discussion. So, um, any additional right, yeah, council members? Yeah, I don't mind voting it. For, oh, oh, go ahead, sorry, Mayor. Okay. No, okay, thank you, Councilman. We appreciate your flexibility. You bet. Um, do any additional council members have questions? Roll call. Decicio. No. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Thank you. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 
Wonderful, thank you. We next move to item 34, contract with Crisis Response Network for web-based emergency shelter availability portal. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, motion to approve item 34. Second. A motion and a second. We have three members of the public to address the council on this item. We will begin with Ash Us, followed by Jimmy Donnelly. Hello, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. All right, this is Ash Us again. I called in yesterday to voice some concerns about the city's plan. Um, and I recognized how hard a lot of staff had worked on that plan. And I expressed my gratitude to you, Mayor Gallego, um, for going public and, and supporting our shelter case or saying you likely would. Um, today, I am calling because I am enraged and because I want to be clear with every single one of you that I will personally ensure that this item and other attempts to criminalize homelessness are put to a halt, or if they're not, that everyone knows about what is going on. I've been part of a team trying to add shelter beds since January of 2019. And can you imagine my frustration when looking through this agenda last night and noticing that you're proposing or even possibly considering the idea that Phoenix PD are going to be the ones who can manage shelter placement for our clients? Shame on every single one of you who were involved in this. I don't know who. Um, shame, just shame on you. When, when COVID happened, when Andre House couldn't have volunteers, we were all here, our staff were here, we tried to make sure that people had food and restrooms. And as if people without shelter, they didn't have enough to worry about, you're making life harder by relocating them. This is a shady attempt to provide a mechanism to allow police to check shelter availability and then arrest or cite or trespass people who don't want to leave their belongings and go to a temporary hotel in Scottsdale for 30 days or wherever you're possibly considering that there's shelter. Yes, you did make some additional options available with COVID. Yes, we lost shelter beds at CAS. Yes, you opened the convention center, but people can't sleep in it. Yes, you took steps to protect the property of business owners, but when you did that, you moved hundreds of people in the lot where they were more likely to get COVID. They were more likely to spread COVID to people in neighborhoods because they're in alleys and parks now because you moved them all out of here. How dare you that police have the ability to put people in shelter that some of you are telling us profits that we can't shelter people. I'm gonna close with a statement from one of our guests because she's experiencing homelessness and doesn't have a mechanism to tune into this meeting um, because y'all haven't created a path, but she says, her name is Darlene, I think sending people to unknown locations only magnifies the trauma of being homeless. We're humans, we're not objects to be placed where it's convenient for the politicians and money holders to pretend we don't exist. You're not going to ship me somewhere to get me off of your street just because you can afford a seat on the council. I, too, am a resident of District 7. I'm not cargo. That's what Darlene said. Thank you all. Jimmy Donnelly will be followed by Tyler Rosenstiel. Mayor. Councilmember Garcia. Sure. Yeah, is that still on the line? I have a question. Mayor Ash is still on the line. Ash, was, was any, I know you work at Andre House and you work with other folks. Did anyone from our city staff contact you about yesterday's plan and then obviously about today's, about this response network? Is this the first time you hear about it or have you had any conversations with anyone on our staff about it? Uh, this was the first time I was hearing about this particular agenda item. I saw it last night. It was news to me. Um, we have met with various departments with the city of Phoenix pertinent to the zoning case. Um, so meeting with offices. Um, so you know, we were not involved in the planning of yesterday's document and certainly had no knowledge indication of anything pertinent to this agenda item. And then I know it's you you work at an organization that has its own leadership but do you feel that organizations such as the one you work with will cooperate with this portal it's hard to tell they're not involved in it um it would be a great tool to have a streamlined process for shelter availability it would be really helpful if that were the case for our orgs to be able to go in and see where there are beds available but it's hard to imagine us being able to cooperate because the numbers don't add up there aren't beds 
Is there such systems now? How do you all track what beds are available or not? The current process right now is that someone goes, single adults experiencing homelessness go to the Brian Garcia Welcome Center at the campus for an intake. Um, people who seek shelter have to line up outside of CAS for shelter. Um, and that's the way that the process has been working. So there's no mechanism where a provider at Circle the City who is treating someone could look online and say, oh, there's a bed in CAS, I can reserve you one. Um, that's not how it works. How it works now is that people have to line up, as I said, and that process has been largely altered due to COVID and to be responsible with social distancing, et cetera. Do you, your organization, or do you know of other organizations, do they share this type of information with police or any other city or county employees about so beds? Most of the information pertinent to people experiencing homelessness is stored in HMIS, which Crisis Response Network is the entity involved in this proposed item. They manage um, HMIS. And so typically when information goes into that, um, it's certainly not expected that it's going to be available by police. Um, there are some municipalities where their outreach folks um, have agreements with the police department, or I've gone to collaborative meetings where there are police officers, I believe it's in Glendale, um, which are in HMIS and have the ability to look at that data to be able to assist the providers, but it's an assistance capacity. It's certainly not in managing who gets a bed and who doesn't. Thank you. Jimmy Donnelly, followed by Tyler. Okay, hi, yes, um, this is Jimmy Donnelly. Um, I'm actually homeless right now. And I'm going by your numbers, I'm pulling off um, Google. Cast numbers for positive um, COVID is actually so low. So what you're offering is, uh, you know, jail people where you're putting them to one of the co worst COVID hotspots. I don't see how that's a positive movement. Uh, you kind of lost me there. Thank you. Our final member of the public is Tyler. Hello, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. My name is Tyler Rosenstiel. I am the Director of the Homeless Management Information System at Crisis Response Network. I wanted to just explain um, the intent behind this portal and to be able to answer any questions. I think everyone um, is familiar with the annual point in time count. Um, this is where every shelter and um, um, persons on the street that are experiencing homelessness are counted and surveyed. And um, each year we're able to say on a single point in time in January, what the bed availability was at individual shelters. We're able to say at shelter X, the number of beds that were available was 100 and the number of beds that were used were 100. Um, it should be of no surprise that when we do that annual count, nearly all of the shelter beds every single night of that count are full. The idea behind this portal is to be able to make that information happen on a live basis. So rather than having the information only annually, where we would know if the shelter beds are full or if there is vacancy, we would be able to have that on a live basis. Um, the coordination that is being discussed is really um, done in conjunction with human services and police. The benefit of this is really not about trying to say, you know, police are dictating where people will go, that is still going to be a, a client's choice. Um, there's no um, policy directives here saying that police must do X or the human services members must do Y. This is really an effort of transparency to be able to ensure that the community as a whole, um, police, outreach workers, other shelters are able to see um, what beds are available. The process that we'll have in place is working with the shelters to be able to ensure that they have an opportunity to um, um, participate in how they would report the information, um, including updating the information themselves, receiving a call or a text from um, us, the Crisis Response Network, or entering the data, entering um, actual client data into the um, municipal campus. So thank you for the opportunity to explain this process. Thank you. Thank you for partnering with us. 
Uh, we'll next go to our assistant city manager, um, Deanna Janovich, for a little bit of um, additional background on this. And if you could tell us, Deanna, if it is a national best practice to, to understand bed availability in your community. Yes, thank you, Mayor, members of the council. It is a national best practice to have a system in place and be able to identify where the bed availability is. I do want to be clear, this is not a police system. This is a regional solution to address where our bed availability is and where we lack beds and a better way to articulate those numbers and the needs for increased beds in our community. We have heard time and time again from our providers the need for additional beds. We don't have a system currently that can tell us. I will tell you and remind the mayor and council that we already have a contract with CPLC and UMOM where they do allocate beds for our first responders so that when they do come in contact with individuals living on the streets, we have beds ready to go, that they can coordinate with our first responders and our outreach teams to get them into a bed. The ultimate goal is to help get individuals off the street. There is no intent here where we are attempting to or trying to arrest people. This is all about trying to help the homeless get housed. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Nowakowski. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So we heard over and over that this is a way for criminalizing homeless. So what I heard from you right now is that it's really a tool to find beds. So if a police officer is called on a homeless individual sleeping in somebody's yard, that they can look at the system or porthole and basically say that you mentioned like CPLC that they have two or three beds open so they can contact that service and basically take that person there um, to get some resources and help. Is that the way it's supposed to be set up or is it that they look at this person and and I'm not sure how the criminalization would happen? You are absolutely correct. This is not to try to criminalize the homeless individuals. This is again to lead with services and try to identify additional tools in the toolbox to help our first responders so when they do encounter people living on the streets, they're able to access and know where the beds are. I'll also add that we have 10 outreach teams, so the first responders will also be coordinating with the outreach teams. They will be the ones working in partnership with them to make the contacts and help them bridge that gap to get them housed. Council Member Garcia. And this might be a question for Chris, and I don't know if Deanna, if you can answer it. Um, isn't it right that the reason we've seen people camping on the street is because we had a court decision that told us that people are allowed to camp only when beds are not available? Am I, I know I'm paraphrasing, but is that correct? There, yeah, I'll, I'll let the city attorney speak to that. Mayor Councilman Garcia, yes, there was a court case um, called the Boise case that um, prohibits um, criminal charging and prosecution of an individual simply for the condition of needing to sleep in a public space. There were still restrictions and things that the uh, jurisdiction could do to manage that situation, but they can't be cited criminally um, for camping or sleeping in public. So is it okay to say that we don't have, currently there's not enough beds, but we also don't have the system to know whether there's beds available or not? Yes, Mayor Councilman Garcia, you are correct. We do not have a system that can tell us where the beds are and the availability of those beds. And we do not have enough beds in the region at this point, which is why in the plan yesterday we had recommended additional low barrier shelter and additional emergency beds around the region. This will also be able to give us really good accurate data to show the need for additional beds. So it's also safe to say that although our intent of the policy, which backing up a little bit, this is why yesterday I was upset because I saw things like this and we were told we weren't gonna move forward with these sorts of things until we actually had a community dialogue. And I'm getting text messages now, and we heard from some community folks now that they had no input in this decision. And now we're moving forward with, if the intent is what you're putting out there, it would be great. We will be able to find resources and allow people to be taken different places. But it's also true that at the hands of the police, 
if they're not able to access a system that says that there is enough beds or there's a bed somewhere, they will now be able to arrest or remove someone from camping. Is that correct, Chris? Mayor, members of the council, Councilman Garcia, um, yes, theoretically, if there is um, no spaces available and the individual is refusing to accept other assistance, then they would be within Boise to cite them. Um, however, they have to make them aware and provide those opportunities. Um, and if the person rejects them, then they would be able to cite them if that was what they chose to do. And I think that's, and I'm assuming that's the criminalization piece that folks are talking about. And without actual policy and intent and being able to talk with partners of how we're going to use these policies, they can get out of our hands and they could be used to therefore criminalize or remove people from certain areas. Um, and so I will be voting no on this. I, I think we need to find community solutions. I think, again, I'll reiterate like yesterday, we need to work with the partners, especially those partners that are working every day with this population. And we need to start working with the folks like the ones who called, the people without shelter, and include them in figuring out how we have these solutions. And I would hate for this to be used in something other than the intent that we're stating now. And so I hope we really can go through that process we talked about yesterday and not attempt to move on things without an actual strategy and, and, and move on things that could potentially hurt more than help. Thank you. Councilman Nowakowski. Thank you, Mayor. Mayor, so um, District 7 happens to be the home of um, CAS and um, all the different services, most of the services in the city of Phoenix for the homeless um, residents. One of the things that um, you made a commitment back in March is that you would ask staff or you had the eight hour rule where you can ask staff to come up with a plan before the summer break. And that's exactly what we did. So yesterday we explained the plan in details with a roadmap of different solutions from services to programs to resources at the city of Phoenix and trying to reach out to other partners besides the city, a regional approach. So I believe that that was something that was committed back in March from all of us and that we basically delivered that yesterday and that the plans out that our staff's going to be working with all these um, organizations. And once again, we've been hearing from the Andre house. So if you can make sure um, Deanna that you include the Andre house in these community outreach and make sure that they're a part of the process. And I think it's really important. The other thing is I understand exactly what um, council member Garcia is talking about, but at the same time, the complaints that we get is that somebody's pitching a tent in front of somebody's front yard and that's um, private property. So they call the police to actually, first of all, ask them to remove their tent because they're actually in some in front of somebody's yard or in the back of somebody's house or in somebody's vacant lot. So that's private property. So then the police officers um, either use our care service, um, Phoenix Cares, where they bring in um, a nonprofit that deals with homelessness and tries to help those individuals with counseling and resources and all that. And now that we're providing this porthole to look for different um, alternatives like beds and all that. So I, I haven't gotten um, complaints about people being um, arrested or are charged for sleeping on, on city sidewalks or anything like that that aren't provided with, um, with, um, with services. So if that's an issue, I think I would like you to look into that, Deanna, and making sure that um, we're looking for all the different uh, results possible to basically help these individuals out. I know the biggest concern that people had is during um, the day when the sun's out there and it's 110 degrees and it's about 120 degrees out on the streets that we provide some kind of air conditioned location. So that's why we opened up our convention center from early morning till, till sun, sun ups to sunset so that individuals can actually stay inside an air conditioned um, area during the day uh, where they can where they can find shelter. 
So if there's any other um, ideas or any other concerns, I'd be more than glad to to accept those or any of our council members, and we'll just feed that back to Marcel or to Deanna. And once again, Deanna, if you can really talk to um, the Andre Center to make Andre um, House to make sure that they're a part of this um, process. To, now that we're taking it out to the community, that they can be a part of that. And anything else we can come up with to help our homeless residents. Um, hopefully, it's a win-win situation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman. Any additional council member comments? Roll call. Mayor, Mayor I'm sorry. Mayor? Councilwoman Pastor. Yes. Um, I just want to get some clarity. This is a portal that uh, we will be able to use to see where beds are located. Mayor, Councilman Pastor, members of the council, yes, that's correct. The intent is to be able to identify where beds are available, not only where the beds are available, but what, what type of beds, are they beds for family, single, those types of uh, questions will help us determine the best fit for the individuals when we're coming in contact with them. And who will be in part of this process or who will be, will it be the CARES people or will it be the police department that's determining what the next steps are? I, I think we as a council need to understand because. Uh, so crisis response network is the provider of the homeless management information system. So they house the system. So they'll be working collectively with the shelter providers. They'll work with the outreach teams. They'll work with our police department so that those types of entities would have access to the system so that as they're coming, the ultimate goal is as they're coming into contact with people that are experiencing homelessness, they'll be able to access the system and see where we have beds available. And then they would be partnering specifically with the outreach teams in order to make the connection with the homeless individuals to get them into housing. Okay, so one of my questions is, uh, I, I want to understand the steps in the process. So the question is, I am homeless right now. I get in. I'm in. Con somebody is in contact with me. What are the steps? And how will this portal help in? this process. So as you come across a homeless individual, once the system is built and individuals are trained and understand how to access the system, you will be able to go in the system, for example, and see that uh, Darlene Newsom with you, Mom, will be putting in her bed availability. If we come into contact with a family, you will be able to tell that there's a bed available at you, Mom so that we can partner with the outreach teams and the homeless individuals to make that connection, do the intake like we do now. We put all of that information into the HMIS system and they will be able to make a connection with you, mom, to get them into that bed. Okay, so where does police come into play? The only involvement with police is sometimes they're the first interactions when they're coming across the homeless individuals. I will tell you, they already work closely with our outreach teams. So when they're coming in contact with homeless individuals in the parks, down by the campus, they have access to the homeless outreach teams and they call those teams and those teams come and provide the contact and services to the homeless individuals. Human Services is actually the lead on this project, not the police department. Okay, so if a police officer comes in contact with me, uh, then they realize that I tell my story, I'm homeless, it's a situation, then they call a crisis management team. Is that CBI? They can call a crisis outreach team. We have 10 different outreach teams. We have eight that work with our CARES program. We have one on our light rail and one that works specifically with our veterans. Okay, so I have another question. Do we have enough? crisis teams? No, uh, I think we proposed in the plan yesterday to increase mental health outreach teams as well as regular outreach teams. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Vice Mayor. Mayor? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, the Vice Mayor had asked to speak at the same time as Councilwoman Petsdorf, so I would go to for her first if she is still interested. No, I'm sorry. I think that was just um, Councilwoman Pastor. I, I don't have any comments. 
Okay. Thank Council you, Member DeCicio. Oh, thank you, Mayor. Just, I just want to make sure we're direct and I'm good with this and I'm good with the police doing it, but I just want to make sure that we also, you know, make sure that the public and the, the city council is aware of what's going on too. The police will, and I'm just going to ask direct, the police will have contact with the homeless, correct, Deanna? Yes, the police will have contact with the homeless. So they will have direct contact with the homeless. So I just want to make sure we get these things on the record and because you know I know there's everyone's trying to manage what other people are thinking or saying it's just better just to lay it all out there at all times and the police will be able to bring individuals to the um the homeless shelter correct yes they will as i stated before we currently have a contract with cplc and you mom for our first responders they are aware of beds that are available there so when they do have individuals uh, that they may come into contact with late at night, they have the opportunity to call those providers and get those individuals into those beds. And they can do that, and they will do that, correct? Yes. They've done it? Yes. Okay, so th nothing's gonna change on that. Okay, I just wanna make sure we just do this, and it's okay wherever the cards you know, fall on these things, but it's better just let the public know. I, I'm good with the police doing this. They've done it in the past. I think it's part of their function. Some may not be, but I am. And I just, but I want to make sure we always get these things on the record and it's clear. Thank you, Mayor. Council Member Garcia. Thank you, Mayor. It literally reads on here um, that the Phoenix Police Department will be the primary group to access the portal. It's in the first paragraph. And so I don't know why I would say that if that's not what's happening. Um, what I would like to do, and I don't know who made the motion, is if I could do a friendly amendment um, that any information that's obtained through this cannot be used to criminalize or give tickets to anyone on the street. Mayor? Councilman Williams. Councilman, could you explain that more? I don't understand what you're saying. So what I, what I explained earlier is that the reason people can camp out on the streets is because there's no beds available. What I don't wanna see is that we now create a system that allows for people um, to be arrested or ticketed um, when our intent has been stated by staff is to actually support people and find them a place to stay if places are available. I'm okay with that. I think that's great. If we use this for good, which the intent is to get people to a place to stay, that's great. But if we're gonna use this as it reads here and it says the Phoenix Police Department will be the primary group to access this portal, what that message sends to me is that we're gonna use this portal in order to remove arrest or ticket people who may be uh, camping. Mayor? Does that make sense? Vice Mayor. Um, so it, it just sounds like there's just a, a lot of a lot of questions and there's just a lot of um, um, things um, that we want to add into this or maybe make changes. I mean, I would, given that I made the motion, I wanted to see, um, I would rather just continue the item for next for next Wednesday for the first, just so that everyone can get their their questions answered and we can do whatever changes we need to make. Because I don't understand what the repercussions would be if we made any of these changes. Thank you. So there, then we have a motion. You have with, we have a motion to continue to July 1st on the table. Do we have a second for that? Second. Second. Okay. I am going to support the motion to continue. Any uh, comments on the motion to continue? Mayor. Um, Councilman DeCicio. 
just that if we do end up continuing, I don't, I, to me, it doesn't matter one way or the other, whether we do it today or next week, but I want us to be extremely clear as to what we're going to do, not do. And I would have an issue and problem, probably, and may not vote for it if it didn't allow us as a policing unit to be able to ticket individuals if they've got a warrant out for them or if there's another situation occurring or if they've broken the law in another place. You can't tell, I mean, I'm just letting the, you know, just letting everyone know, you cannot tell the police officers who are required by law to do certain functions. They're required to do that. If they see something, yeah, they can let things go, like they can let tickets or things like that go by. But to actually put out a policy, you know, we get in a very fine line there, Mayor. So from my end, they have to have those abilities to do that. That's part of their toolbox. We just have to believe that they're gonna do it responsibly. But we need to be very clear as to what they've done in the past and if there are gonna be any changes from what they've done in the past and be very clear about this stuff. I get where Council Member Garcia is going. I respect him for that. We just don't have to agree, but I just wanna make sure there's complete clarity when we vote on this, Mayor. Thank you. Mayor, may I respond to that? Sure. So Council Member, I'm not saying that warrants or other sort of criminal activity that's happening that we would somehow not allow officers to do their job. I'm simply saying, do not use this database to create a criminal, to create the fact that you're able to say that there is a bed somewhere and the person should be ticketed for that reason. So all the things you said, I think, you know, that's what officers are out there to okay. do. Um, so I would not prevent anything that they're doing now. I'm simply saying that I wouldn't be supportive of creating a database simply for the excuse to be able to stick it or get people out of the, wherever they're at. Okay, I'd like to see what that is because I think you and I fall on the same line when it comes to, you know, you don't want to see government intrusion into people's lives. I get it. And creating databases always concern me. Facial recognition, I think, concerns us, you know. So if you can approach it and let me look at it that way, I might be supportive of that. Mayor, but we fall on the same line when it comes mayor. to. Yes, and, and I think um, Council Member Decisio, and, and I think that's part of the reason why I think it's a good idea to continue the item for another week, just so that there can be questions answered and that we can all come in on the, on the same page next week and be able to approve this item. Thank you, Mayor. I, I'm fine. With, oh, sorry. I'm fine with that then on my end, Mayor. Wonderful. Yes. Councilman Williams. This is good. Uh, since it's going to come back next week, I want to understand if you are talking about homeless in encampments or individuals that live on the street, because there's a big difference. Many of the individuals do not desire to go to a shelter or to look for a bed. Uh, and I don't think, I'm pretty sure the police do not take any action against them. Uh, but I want to make sure if that's not included in this language. An encampment, a large encampment, okay. But individuals, uh, I have a little problem with messing with them. So could staff explain that when they bring it back next week, please? Mayor, Council Member Williams, yes. Staff will um, brief the council on this item and be uh, ready next week to explain that as well. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion to continue this item till July 1st, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion to continue passes unanimously. We next go to item 35, which is a CARES Act emergency funding to the Arizona Community Action Association. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, we have a motion to approve item 35. Second. Council member comments. Mayor. Councilman DeCicio, followed by Councilwoman Pastor. Thank you. One of those other clarity moments. <laughs> uh, so the council granted this group wildfire um, $30 million. And now of the 30 million, they're giving $2 million back, correct? Yes. 
One moment, yeah. we're getting, Ms. Franklin is coming forward, just a moment, Councilman. Okay, then yeah. I'll just give you a second question on that. I'm sorry, yeah, I interrupted. The answer is yes. No, it's Councilwoman Pastor, and what you're saying is oh. correct, because it's on page 49. Right. I'm just trying to get some things out there is all. Thank you for that. Uh, and then of that 2 million to staff, why is this occurring? Uh, you know, what's happening with that 2 million? And why did we get, it's rare that we get anything back, but why is that? Thank you, Councilman. Uh, Ms. Franklin will answer. Thank Mayor, you. Mayor Gallego and Councilman DeCicio, I apologize. Uh, I want to make sure I understand your question correctly. I was uh, following up on that other item. Were you asking, is your question okay. that the city of Phoenix allocated a significant dollar amount to wildfire, and now of that dollar amount that the city of Phoenix allocated to wildfire, that the city of Phoenix Human Services Department is now receiving $2 million? Your question is, is, is that the question? Yes, it is perfectly. Thank you. Sure. Okay. And so the question is why. Sure, sure. So, uh, Mayor Geigo and Councilman DeCicio, we are one of several community action agencies throughout the state of Arizona. And so, uh, Wildfire is an association that is responsible for uh, representing community action agencies as well as fighting poverty. As a community action agency within the city of Phoenix, if you will, the Human Services Department is wildfire and in their efforts to get that 20 something million dollars that the city allocated to wildfire to spend as it relates to eviction uh, prevention, mortgage utility assistance, then is giving us back, if you will, as the community action agency in the city of Phoenix that money. So an example could be, you know, um, CPLC could potentially be receiving some money from wildfire of this $20 million. We are just as a community action agency taking a portion of that and spending it. But why, why would we have just have kept it from the start? Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, members of the council, we contracted with Wildfire for the entire amount to administer the program. And so the entire uh, 22 million outside of the 2 million for administration went to them directly. They're, they're allocating to two, 10 different agencies to administer the funding and track it and ensure that they're securing and paying the utility and um, water bills for us. So they will be overseeing it sim similar to what they do currently as the um, Community Action Agency Association for the state. So more for ease and streamline so, purposes to answer your question directly. Okay, so when, and so just, you know, my antenna always goes up on stuff like this because when you see this in the business community, it's basically a workaround to try to get around rules that are already in place or something like that. So. It just seems odd because I've never seen that before. Uh, the city of Phoenix do that, very unusual. So do we have to fo uh, follow the same uh, CARES Act rules? Mayor, Councilman DeCicio, members of council, absolutely. We have to follow all of the same requirements that the other nine agencies administering the program will have to follow. And Wildfire has to do it as well, correct? Yes. So all the requirements on them. It just seems a little odd. I'll, I'm going to be voting no just because I don't. I feel uneasy about it, and it just I've never seen that before. But th those are my questions, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Councilwoman Pastor. Do you have additional questions? Yeah, I have the exact same question. So my my question is, why didn't we keep the 20 million, or yeah, 20 million within our human service agency? Um, I'm not really sure why we didn't keep it. Uh, we're paying an administrative cost to wildfire. So now we paid an administrative cost uh, for them to administer this and then to give us uh, 20 million back when we gave them um, 22 million. And I mean, I'm sorry, 2 million back um, when we could have just administered it ourselves. 
So that's where I'm uh, not understanding. Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, members of the council, we do not have the staffing capacity to administer $20 million. The agencies that wildfire contracts with currently ha is agencies like CPLC and other agencies across the city that have the ability to reach some of the populations that we can't or don't reach, and we do not have enough staffing and human services to administer the $20 million. So I understand the 20 million, but why didn't we keep the 2 million? Um, so am I hearing that with this 2 million, this, we have enough staff to administer it or Wirefire is administering the utility rent and mortgage and they're just paying us 2 million for those items? Mayor, Councilman Pastor, and members of the council, the $2 million coming to human services, they will be administering that portion of the program. The remaining $20 million will be administered by the other nine agencies throughout the city. And Wildfire will be overseeing and monitoring the entire program for the uh, total $24 million. And I have one more question. Um, all the groups that like CPLC and, and all the community action agencies, do they also receive money for administrative costs? Mayor, Councilman Pastor, members of the council, yes, they get a, a prorated amount based on the amount of funding that they're taking for each of the agencies. It, it's, with, okay. it's, it, it's within the overall pot of money that you, you authorize as a part of this program. No, I understand that, and, and, and I think this is where I had um, some difficulty with this because um, we have, as community action agencies, basically the city is going to charge 20% uh, for overhead or for administrative costs through this two, two million. My understanding is with this two million. Yes. Mayor, Councilman Pastor, members of the council, the administration is all within the original 24 million, the 20 percent. I understand that. So what I'm asking is not only out of that 24, 22, wildfire takes a 20 percent cut, then you have these community action agencies also administering dollars out to the community, and they take a percentage of uh, of administering. That's what I'm trying to figure out. Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, members of council, no, it's all within the same. So I believe you authorized 20 million for the service side and 4 million for the administration. That 4 million is split up between all of the entities. So it's not an additional. Okay, but okay, so let's get clear. The 4 million that has been authorized. Four million goes to wildfire. Twenty percent of their administration cost goes to wildfire. Then I'll use another nonprofit agency, A, B, and C. They get uh, they put in money. We can administer. Uh, I don't know a million dollars uh, out of the four million. We have this twenty percent administrative cost. So. So, Mayor, Councilman Pastor, members of the council, let me try to see if. I understand what you're saying. Wildfire is not getting the entire four million. They're getting a portion of the four million, and then they're also allocating some of that four million to the agencies administering the program. So they are not so taking. That's what I, yes. They're not taking yes, the entire twenty percent. Okay. So what I'm hearing from you is that twenty percent is shared amongst all the agencies. Yes, the, the uh, out of the four million. Yes. So then, um, we're considered a community action agency, and so we are sharing uh, part of the four million in administrative cost. Yes, that's correct. And plus, we get this additional two million. The two million includes the administration. So when each agency is getting their awards. For example, if I'm getting two million, I have already worked with Wildfire to determine contractually how much money I can spend, and then based on how much money I can spend, they're including the administration into that. 
So I okay. believe, and I have Marshall sitting next to me, the two million award is not just the direct service, it includes the administration. And how much is the cost for administration? Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, members of the council, Marshall is getting that information for you. Mayor, may I ask, uh, Councilman Pastor, may I just ask a question here while they're waiting? Sure. Uh, those are amazing questions. And, but I don't think the staff is understanding what you're asking because I understand it. You wanna know, I mean, so we're giving $4 million. The math is just not adding up, Deanna, uh, just being respectful on that too. I mean, Councilman Pastor is asking really good questions here. They're keeping $4 million. And then, uh, oh, I'm sorry, what's that, <laughs> Laura? Sorry. I just said I'm smart. <laughs> you are. I mean, you've, you've been nailing it in the last several meetings on some of these meetings. I'm like, oh my gosh, didn't even think of that. You know, not that I should, but they're brilliant. I mean, they're really good. So of the 22 million, uh, 4 million plus is going over to wildfire, correct? Mayor, Councilman DeCiso, members of the council, there is a $4 million administrative allocation to the $24 million that you authorized. So it's $20 million for services, $4 million for administration. The entire $24 million is going to wildfire. They're allocating to the 10 agencies a portion of program and a portion of admin, and then they're also getting a portion of admin. And that's all in well, that four the, million. Right, but see the math that it, it, it's just not clear and I'll explain why. Because the way you were describing it, it's like four million is going to them, then of the proportionate amount that comes out to each of the different cities or the different entities, we're gonna be covering our administration too. So I think that if you were to say, here's what everybody's getting, you might be better off. How much goes towards services and then how much goes toward administration? I think that's a simple question. So in total, 20 million goes to services and four million goes to administration. We don't have the breakout by all 10, but if the council would like to continue this item as well, we will be happy to get that information in the next week. Um, I, I'd be fine with delaying Ed, it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Ed, what I would like is uh, in the future just the breakdown of where all the CARES money is going to. And like example of this one, um, the breakdown as uh, Councilman DeCicio, the administrative, and then the service of what really, what, who is really receiving the money now? because that's been one of my, my challenges or difficulties in this whole process as we're paying administrative costs everywhere and how much money really gets to the community. Understood. And so I would like to know um, these uh, agenda reports, the breakdown of where, what the administrative cost is and, who is and the services they're receiving. Understood. Thank you. Yeah, me too. I think those are amazing. That's perfect. Oh, I'm fine with the vote. Kate, you're talking, you're on mute. Mayor, I think you're on yeah, mute. We're not nice. hearing you. It's 22 million. So the four million would be twenty six million. Mayor Councilman Pastor, it's twenty four million total. Of, of of which the city of Phoenix is one of the agencies that's administering the money. And so you, you have to think of it as we're in a position where we are both a grantor as a corporation, we received CARES money, and we're giving that CARES money as a corporation in one case to wildfire to administer a program of utility and rent assistance. Then our human services department 
serves as an agency similar to nine other agencies in the community. And so as one of those 10 agencies, our human services department then receives some money to get to the community. So it, it's, it's confusing in the sense that we're, we're on both sides of that. We're the grantor as a corporation and we're also uh, a, an agency, administering agency as part of that network with wildfire. Yes, but I, I think it's just confusing. We could have just kept the two million and administered it. Thank you. I think part of the issue may have been that we wanted to use existing systems and people who are experienced with utility aid. And so that usually the money is not coming from the city. It's often coming from the federal government, although we are occasionally, I think, passing through federal dollars. So uh, we do have a motion on the table, and it's my understanding we are ready to move forward with a motion to approve. Roll call. Mr. Cecio. Uh, no, Mayor, I'd like to have Mayor Schell make sure she tells us what the amount is on that legal stuff, too. Thank you, Mayor. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring? No. Williams? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 7-2. Thank you. I am going to take items 36 and 61 together. Both are related to early childhood. I appreciate all that our partners and our city staff are doing to serve our entire community, including our youngest residents during this difficult time. Um, these items will help us move forward with our partnership with First Things First and Family Resource Centers. Uh, tough being a parent at any time, but uh, during COVID-19, even more difficult. And First Things First can help us with things like virtual case management, development milestones, even fun classes. We're also supporting and investing in Head Start and our preschool programs, and these programs are so vital, providing additional resources during COVID, so valuable. So I want to thank everyone who has been involved. Uh, Vice Mayor, I would entertain a motion on items 36 and 61. Yes, I will make a motion to approve items 36 and 61. Second. Any additional council member comments or questions? Roll call. DeCicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. <clears throat> I apologize, uh, Council Member Waring. Was that a yes or a no? Yes. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Williams. Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. Passes 9 0. <gasps> Woohoo! Wary. <laughs> That's the thing, we're all parents. We next move to item 60 award for redevelopment of Deck Park Vista uh, Apartments. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, motion to approve item 60. Second. We, um, have three members of the uh, to of the public to address us on this one. We will begin with Sissy Veteran, followed by Diana Dee Dee Devine. Mayor Sissy Veterans is not on the line. Wonderful. Then we will go to Dee Dee, followed by Joe Keeper, our our great partners on this endeavor. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, hello, Mayor and Council. Um, and um, I just want to say that Native American Connections is always happy to participate with the City of Phoenix in really trying to um, fill our housing gap for all residents of the City of Phoenix. Um, we did respond to the Deck Park proposal and um, our very excited to have been awarded that um, that contract uh, to redevelop the deck park. Uh, we're proposing a 
201 units. We think that's the right mix of units at that site. Um, it triples the size of the units that we can serve right in the downtown area for both affordable and attainable units. Um, we're going to uh, bring a, a, a leverage of the low-income housing tax credit program to the site for the construction of the site. Um, probably the best uh, use of tax credits is when you're building um, using uh, wood frame construction. And so that's what got us to the number of units that we think are the most cost effective to build the maximum amount of units to keep them affordable um, for uh, the residents in downtown Phoenix. Um, we are, uh, as you know, we have over a thousand units of housing in the Phoenix uh, metropolitan area. And so um, we've already been reached out to some of the residents there that um, we've reassuring them. I think that's one of our strengths as Native American Connections to make sure that everybody knows that um, we're gonna, um, we're not gonna uh, demo a property and make somebody homeless to build an affordable housing project to make sure that everybody has uh, those who want to uh, be re relocated or those who who might want to go into some of these downtown properties. Oh, I think I met my limit. I'll let Joe pick up from there. Wonderful, Joe. Uh, Mayor and council members, hopefully you can hear me okay. Yes. Excellent. Well, um, it's always hard to follow Didi, as <laughs> everyone knows, so I'll try my best here. But just uh, yeah, um, kind of finishing off, you know, the the housing continuum choices that Native American Connections provides. I mean, yesterday we, we, we talked about homelessness. You know, we operate um, senior housing sites in addition to workforce family that are a combination of mixed income and mixed use. So we're really excited with this opportunity to be partnership with the neighborhood and the city to redevelop really what might be one of the last opportunities to create more affordability in downtown Phoenix, uh, given where the market has gone over the last couple of years. Um, just excited to get started on it. Thank you very much. Thank you for your partnership. Uh, that concludes our public comment on this item. Council Member Garcia, this is in your district. Well, thank you, Mayor. I want to express support for this project. I know the project has uh, has had a long, complicated, a little bit of complicated history, but with the leadership of our housing director, Cindy, I think we've been able to find a great partner, Native American Connections, who's nationally recognized as, as a leader in this area. Um, I have had meetings at the site itself. I've literally walked through talking to all the neighbors and I wanna assure them that housing department and all of us will be taking care of them. We'll be making sure that they get moving fees, that they find a place, whether it's a new permanent home or a temporary home, as they're able to come back uh, to the property once this, this project is fully developed. And, and I think Native American Connections will take care of those folks. Um, we have amazing residents there at Deck Park Vista who deserve and, and the support and, and the commitment um, from from our uh, from both our staff and, and from the community at large. So I think that community growing is going to be better for all of us and obviously to be able to maintain affordability and support uh, for folks maybe that don't have a home to be able to live downtown is, is a great deal. Um, this Redevelopment is part of our overall progress on increasing on increasing the amount of affordable housing. Um, we've heard, you know, this whole year and with the presentation a couple of meetings ago from Cindy and the housing team that we do have a deficit in housing. And I hope this, along with many more projects, will continue to put a dent on that. And so with that, I move uh, to to pass item 60. Second. Mayor, we. We already had a, a motion and a second. Oh, that's right. Any additional comments? Roll call. Decisio. 
Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. No. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yeah, I want to explain my vote. Please. So I, so I just want to thank Cindy so much for for leading the charge on this. For affordable housing is incredibly important, and we, um, you know, we're very excited to have you on the team and leading this with us. We see the need, we see the numbers, and I'm gonna be voting yes on this. Thank you. Gallego. Yes. Passes eight one. We next move to item 64, Phoenix Central Station. Vice Mayor, do we have a motion? Yes, motion to approve item 64, amend business terms for Phoenix Central Station, 300 North Central Avenue. Second. We have a motion and a second. There was a member of the public to address uh, us on this item, but no longer. Council member comments. Councilwoman Pastor. Mayor, um, this item is uh, was very important to me because uh, this was one of the items, one of the last items uh, that my dad was working on. And um, what is uh, amazing was because at the time of the vote, um, there was a hotel that was going to be built. And uh, there were several uh, members in the community that did not want that hotel to be built. And I took, um, I took the vote because I thought the project was a great project and uh, uh, took a little hits and bruises, uh, but I still think it's a great project. What I had asked, um, I had asked Chris Mackey uh, in looking at this because we had a 5% workforce uh, piece. I asked Chris if she could go back to speak to the person that received the award and if we could go to 10% in the workforce housing because that's where the number is today. Um, I believe, Chris, you can tell me um, what exactly uh, the awardee has said. And then um, the other item I asked for was um, in, the, in the contract, it says 10 years for uh, workforce uh, housing. Um, I had then asked, is it possible to go to 15? So, Chris, I don't know what the answer is. This is what I asked before the meeting, so. Mayor Councilwoman Pastor, uh, thanks for the question. And yes, thank you for reaching out to me before the meeting and asking that question. I did reach out to the developer, uh, Metastar Monza Harani, and we did talk through your request of the 10% in workforce housing. As you'll remember, this is a project that isn't receiving any city incentives and over our property that's valued at approximately $13 million, over the 99 year term, it'll put approximately $172 million into our public transit, uh, our public transit system. So that's the community benefit that we had negotiated. Uh, Mr. Harani though, did um, admire your request and has agreed to move to 7% of workforce housing, so 25 units now, because without the hotel, there's additional high density residential market rate units. So he's agreed to go to the 7%, which is 25 units. He also has agreed to your request of 15 years for those 25 units. Well, that is good news. Um, um, and I think this is a great project and we, we save uh, our transit area and our, our transportation area and our transit runs through uh, downtown. And I think this will be a benefic benefit to our city. So thank you so much. Councilman Nowakowski. Well, Mayor, this is another great project in District 7, something that we've been working on for a while. Um, 
Chris, I, I just want to give you the kudos. You always uh, make things happen. Uh, we had a lot of hiccups on this one because we had a transit center, not just a normal transit center, but our main transit center where it was a bus transit center plus a major hub for our um, light rail. And, you know, we were able to work out with the developer that they would keep the um, transit center there. Uh, we talked about all kinds of retail space that we need for the community. Um, people wanted to make sure that the retail was there. And then we had some concerns about the hotel and we were able to work that out. I wasn't able to support it at first, but now that they took the um, hotel component out of it and they brought in more um, workforce housing um, designed to it and more family resident rental units, uh, what a great project. It's really, once again, a Team Phoenix approach where we brought everybody together, the community, our staff, the developer, and made this wonderful project. It's gonna be one of the jewels of downtown. I think people are gonna come in from other um, cities just to see how you can incorporate not only the buses, but the light rail and all the retail and families together at one place. So once again, Chris, thank you so much for your patience. Uh, for able to pull everyone together and not pulling out your hair. <laughs> Thank you. And I'll be voting yes on this. Thank you, Councilman. Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Heck yeah. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Wearing. Wearing. No. Good. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes eight one. We next move to item 82, rezoning application for Northwest corner of 25th Street and Broadway. Mayor. Yes. Do we don't need to do the omnibus first? I believe we got the rest of them in the original omnibus, but uh, we'll turn to our city attorney to see if we need a Yes, Mayor, um, Vice Mayor, those other items were included in the omnibus at the beginning of the meeting. Okay, perfect. So, uh, go ahead. The motion to approve item 82 rezoning application for Northwest, Northwest corner of 25th Street and Broadway Road. Second. Mayor. Okay. Councilwoman Williams. Uh, I've had many emails and calls, but I am not going to be able to support the motion. This is an area that I worked on with Councilman Good and many of the neighbors to do an overlay to really build a neighborhood. And I know we put tens of millions of dollars in there to stabilize it, and they are very opposed to this, and I honor. Um, the recommendation. Uh, thank you, Councilwoman. I have heard similar feedback. Um, we have four members of the public, including the applicant and the applicant's representative here to address the council. Um, I will begin with the owner of the property, Kenya Connor. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council Members. I hope everyone can hear me. Uh, yes, we can. Um, again, my name is Kenya K. Connor. I have owned the property for three years. 
uh, proudly paid taxes on the property. Um, I have proudly paid uh, the uh, uh, utility bills on the property for the last three years. I have served this community um, for close to 18 years. I am trying to start a respectable business and I'm looking for your support. Um, as of date, there has been no logical reason why this business um, isn't, uh, uh, we won't be able to move forward. Um, I have heard about the overlay and I do know that there is some resistance there, um, but we have won the village support, we have won the Planning Commission support, and we're hoping that we also win your support to move forward. This project will bring jobs to the community, revenue to the city, and we're looking forward to uh, revitalize this community. Um, it would be an essential part of this city and not only bring revenue from the residents of the city, but from the entire uh, uh, state as well. So we're looking forward to revitalizing this area and also uh, bringing jobs and training to this uh, area. So we're hoping that uh, we uh, win your support today and uh, uh, continue the growth in South Phoenix. Thank you. Do we have Shelly Smith? Yes, Mayor. Pastor, can you hear me? Uh, it looks like it just muted again. Hello. Uh, now we have you. Go ahead. Floor is yours. Thank you, Mayor, Council. I am a member, and I was born and raised in the community. I'm a pastor in the community also and a neighbor. I live in the community, and the history of this building is, has a long past, and one of the things I look at about we have the, the council before and members of the community that had started the Four Corners project. And it's a great idea, it's a great venture, but at one time it was stopped. It, it, it had actually stopped. And I look at all the failures we've had with the building itself, and the people in the community that have stepped in to open a business there with a daycare center a community center and they have literally stopped because they have no true investment in the building, just an investment in the community. And one of the things I look at is if this passes today, this will bring forth a revitalization of the Four Corners project to bring other developers in the community to develop where the old fire station was, um, bringing a vision for this community, because right now the Four Corners plan was actually a great plan, but if you have no one with a vision to continue investing their time in it, it won't go anywhere. And as I told the community before, the city had slated part of the Four Corners property on the southwest corner of Broadway and 24th Street and sold. 
that really put a, a damper on what we actually need to complete the Four Corners project itself. But I, I duly support this project here at 25th Street and Broadway because it actually will start the revitalization project process in our community. And I hope that you will approve it because um, this will bring success for other projects and people to come in our community and businesses to move forward with development of this project in the corner itself. Thank you. Thank you. Twana will be followed by Jeff Stevens. Hi. Oh, sorry. That's probably by Jeff. All right. Sorry. Can you hear me okay? Beautifully. Awesome. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council City uh, City Council members. My name is Tawana Brunson. I am a South Phoenix Village resident, member of the Broadway Heritage Neighborhood Association. I am a homeowner, and I'm the president of Broadway Estates Block Watch Association. I've attended countless meetings with South Mountain Phoenix Village, Phoenix Planning Commission, Councilman Garcia, and other people that reside outside of the community that support this request. However, Broadway Estates Block Watch Association, former Councilman Michael Johnson, Cody Williams, Community Excellent Project, Greg Brownell, and yes, I did say Greg Brownell and Mike Johnson, both support this agenda. They, they, they support opposal, well, I apologize, they support opposal of agenda item 82. Not only do they oppose it, but I've obtained over 600 opposing signatures from residents in this community that also oppose this measure. And yes, I did state 600. I submitted the opposing uh, petitions on Monday to be entered into the record. Hundreds of residents like myself have made 30 year investments into our homes and the vast majority of our residents are against having this type of business in our community. Councilman Garcia, we are very disappointed that you appear to be considering this request. Every conversation I've had with you up until recent, I have appreciated the fact that I felt like you had a service heart for this community. But this is very disappointing. Our community has worked extremely hard to ensure zoning ordinance 660 four corner overlay was put into place to protect our community from unwanted excuse me, unwanted businesses, such as the proposed business. We ask that you support the residents and oppose this permit. Respectfully, sir, either way, we see you, we will see you at the polls because I will ensure the community remembers how you voted today. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Jeff will be our final speaker on this item. Uh, Mayor and Council, I hope you can hear me all right. We can. Uh, my name is Jeff Stevens and I'm working with Kay Connor. I'm an architect and I'm also in, in 1999 wrote the uh, overlay zoning for this area. And just to give you a little background, a little history on it. Uh, this is a C2 area and C2 is, is light industrial, uh, light, excuse me, commercial. And it's used as a buffer to for the surrounding neighborhood and surrounding residential areas. Uh, under this, as we wrote this, and I wrote this with Dean Brennan at CPD and me, and we together decided that uh, a use like a funeral home would be allowed, but we would do it under a special use permit. That's why we're here today. Uh, this thing has been abandoned now for 20 years and has been nothing but a drug hangout and a other nefarious goings on have, have happened over here in the last uh, 20 years. We're hoping that with this project, we will not only renovate this building, but also the lot next door and uh, combine a parking lot and also try to, as uh, others have alluded to, uh, jumpstart this whole area down here where nothing really has happened except for a community center down at 24th and Broadway, uh, probably about 12 years ago, maybe longer. So we're hoping that uh, this will go because this was uh, written into the Four Corners Overlay Zoning as an active part of the C2 area. 
as a buffer for the surrounding residential area and they wanted businesses, uh, no pun intended, that were quiet and that could uh, come in and not uh, disrupt anybody or anything. And we certainly believe that Kay's building is going to do that. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes the public comment on this item. Vice Mayor. Yeah, so I, I just had a question for, for Alan. Alan, given the comments that we just heard with, from the gentleman um, right now, so it's my understanding that the community will continue to have a say on special permits in this area because of the four corners. I understand the overlay is clear that certain projects are allowed through a special permit and that other projects are not. Can you just can you just clarify that for us, please? And if we can just put that on the record. Sure. Uh, thank you, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor. Uh, this particular property uh, is zoned C2 with a Four Corners Overlay Zoning District along with the Rio Salado uh, Interim Overlay Zoning District. And those overlay zoning districts change some of the base uh, C2 zoning standards. And so uh, C2 zoning district throughout the city would allow for a mortuary use to go in by right without a, a rezoning action uh, by the mayor and council. However, when the Four Corners overlay uh, was developed with the community and the discussions in the early 2000s and then adopted by council, they debated uh, exactly what types of uses they wanted to have in the overlay at the time. And what came out of that was that a mortuary use uh, could be a use that would be permitted within there, but it wasn't going to be a by right use. It would be an individual look that would come through a special permit request and go to the council to be evaluated and then approved to allow that particular use. Uh, and so that's the way the, the overlay was set up. And that's what the applicant is here uh, today, that they brought forward an application that was approved by a six to four vote from the South Mountain Village Planning Committee, approved by a nine to zero vote of the Planning Commission uh, to request the special permit and the underlying uses within the C2 zoning district. Great, thank you, appreciate it. I think it is important though to note that the community has had a robust debate about whether a mortuary was important before under the leadership of Cody Williams, the community decided that they did not want a mortuary in the area. So this is very much a debate that we have had before. I wanna strongly disagree with Mr. Stevens' characterization that there's just a, this is just a drug hangout and that there's nothing happening in this community. You gotta come back and visit. There are wonderful restaurants, great childcare facilities, robust churches, the Keys Community Center, the city has invested in upgrading parks facilities, repaving in the area. This has been a robust effort. We have had significant conversations about what type of development that we wanna see in this area and community members have showed up over and over again. Uh, part of that has led to multiple nonprofit partners, including FSL making important investments in housing so to say nothing is happening but drugs is deeply, deeply inaccurate. Uh, the great work that our Block Watch and Neighborhood Association leaders are doing is important to me. I value it. Um, for me, an important moment was Councilman Williams, who, who served this area, telling me, if you think that a mortuary is going to be catalytic to the, your vision of what type of development you want to see in this corridor, then support it. But otherwise, keep the commitments to residents that have been made over decades. So I will be standing with the Broadway Estates Block Watch and voting no on this item. Council Member Garcia. Mayor. Thank you, Mayor. And, and I think um, this, was, this was a tough case. This is, I've learned a lot through, through this, this case. We spent a lot of time on it. Um, I wanna first acknowledge the amazing generational work that has been done uh, in what is called the Four Corners area. Uh, this area, which is a mile from my home, has been in, invested in, you're right, the housing has been invested, but it still continues to need a lot of support. And so I've literally walked this property, Mayor, it's, it's been vacant for over a decade, and, and, and there is things there that, that need to be fixed. Um, the property we are, are considered for special permit today has a long history itself. It was once a market, 
It was later a community space, and like I said, it's unfortunately been vacant uh, for over a decade. Um, I do not take this decision lightly. I have sat in numerous conversations and a lot of meetings, like Tawana and others have said, um, with people for and against this permit. Um, I want to first assure that making this decision will not impact the, the question that the vice mayor asked. It will not impact or set a different standard for any uh, uh, future similar requests in the area. They would still all have to go through this same process. Um, I've come to appreciate the applicant's determination and commitment to the community in investing her own money and, and putting her children's future and wanting to develop in this area. I think it is important to support black-owned business, especially in this area. And so I appreciate Kay's work and, and what she's done and, and what we've asked her to do, which is ask, actually go through this process twice. Um, after the Village Planning Committee and Planning Commission's approving this for a second time, um, I feel it's the right thing to permit the permit to be granted. And, I, and that's, I'm supporting it. Um, as a representative of the district, uh, I, I think that area still needs a lot of work. Um, I also want to say to those who were against the special permit, um, that those that are against and for it, that our priority is to continue to work in this area, and more specifically with the 24th Street and Broadway property that is owned by Neighborhood Services Department. We have so, spoken to staff, to Allen, to Spencer, um, to our housing department. We're, we're going to be moving forward with the process and community input to hopefully finally get something done in that area um, that can both address affordable housing and the commercial commercial space that's needed in the area. Um, I, I lastly, and I know Tawana, you're probably really upset at me right now, but I want to recognize your work. Uh, Tawana has worked tirelessly and, and harder than anyone I've seen um, on a case uh, this entire year that I've been in office. Um, I, I, I've seen her work door by door, be at every meeting. Um, on this issue and, and this situation, we're, we're happening to, to disagree. I really do think that there's a lot of work to be done in this area. I believe you have the heart and determination to make sure that, that this community, our community, is better. And I really hope we can work together with yourself and a lot of the folks that came in through the investment that the city made in the housing that's there uh, to make sure that the rest of the Four Corner area is prosperous and we get what we need. Um, again, at this time, I will be supporting Ms. K and, and we'll be there to support her business and the rest of the development of the Four Corners area. Thank you. Councilman DeCicio. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm also gonna be supporting the case. I'm gonna be supporting the council member for the district. Uh, he, you know, as a general rule on, on the council here, we do support the council member in that area because they're supposed to know what's really happening. I wasn't aware of Cody and Michael and others who are friends. And I like them a lot, but you know those were also a long time ago, so I don't know. I haven't heard anything from them as to whether or not they would be opposing this or not. The other part of it deals with funeral homes. I mean, they're the least intrusive of any use you could ever put in, whether it's next. I mean, if you drive by, you will see many, many funeral homes right next door to homes. And I haven't heard a single argument up here on the council other than, hey, they didn't like it the, as a previous elected officials, so I'm not gonna like it either. I mean, if someone could, I'd like to hear what a, a, a cogent argument would be opposing a use like this. I've never heard us oppose a use like this that is so low intensity, even if it was right next to homes. So why, if, especially if the pop, and you know, just to defend the individual that spoke earlier too, I didn't hear him say that the entire area was full of drug users and places like that. He was very specific to the property itself. And that may or may not be the case, I don't know. I mean, it does happen when you have vacant lots. Vacant lots are literally, no matter where you're at in the city of Phoenix or actually in the country, they are magnets to uses that people wouldn't like to have next door to them uh, until they're developed out. So could someone present, present at least and yeah, an argument as to why this is a bad land use. 
especially when it was allowed and the special use permit was already anticipated ahead of time. Other than you don't like it. Uh, I, I believe Twana is still online, uh, but yeah, they, they submitted a, a variety of comments to all of our offices, including uh, traffic patterns, effect on neighboring development. So um, for our staff, if we could unmute Twana and, and she could address the concerns. Absolutely, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mayor, I appreciate that. Uh, I can give you multiple reasons, sir. Uh, First and foremost, to say that nothing's been going on in the area, I am a newer homeowner. I've only had my home for two years. Uh, but mo as the mayor stated, traffic uh, traffic um, issues is a reason. But more so than anything, there's unintended consequences that could come about from allowing this. And I, do, I did hear earlier that it was stated that everything would come across, uh, it would still have to go through this process. But the point of the matter is, is that I've I've spoken with hundreds of people. I've talked with hundreds of people who do not want this. And, and the reasons the reasons are one of the reasons are this this applicant has no interest in helping this community whatsoever. She is not vested in this. She's not a resident of this area. She doesn't plan on supporting this area. Uh, she's she's flat out told us at meetings that she would like to use the, the building, the facility for pretty much anything and everything except for a mortuary. So uh, chapel uses, um, community meetings, things of that nature. She's, she's stating that she's gonna bring jobs to the community. She may be able to bring about four or five jobs to the community, maybe, maybe. Anyone that knows how a mortuary is operated knows that the individuals there have dual, dual functions or more. <clears throat> Excuse me, but but the point of the matter is, is we have a community center less than a block away from the building where we currently hold meetings. Well, up until the COVID, uh, we have 30 funeral homes and I purposely limited the mileage to within 10 miles of this business, of this proposed business. So it's destined most businesses. And I'm sure you all know this fail within the first five years. Us as homeowners, we we do not we've made a 30 year investment into our homes. And so we don't want someone that's just coming into the area to make a profit and, and then leave us high and dry. She's made no she she spoke specifically at the South Phoenix Village Planning Committee and advised when she was asked uh, what financing options she would provide. She said there would be none. People have insurance policies, but this this area is mostly low-income low individuals. I, I, now, there's newer homeowners like myself where, where we have, you know, uh, medium incomes, but that wouldn't be something that would benefit our community. We're looking for retail businesses and things like that. Thank you for the opportunity to speak again, Mayor. I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, to be fair, we should also give the applicant or the applicant's representative an opportunity to also provide additional input. So um, we, if, if staff could unmute, I guess we'll begin with the applicant and then if the applicant prefers her representative, that works for me as well. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. I've heard that Mrs. Brunson uh, said that the building would not be used but for anything else but for the funeral home. Since the beginning of the project, I've welcomed the community into this project and said and welcomed the community in. This building, this project is community friendly. Um, this building, this project has always welcomed into uh, the uh, this building. Uh, we want to revitalize because this building has a lot of history in it, and we know that. Um, we want to welcome the uh, the leaders back into this uh, building for workshops and uh, whatever else we want. Uh, they want to use the building for um, the uh, the business itself 
can reach out to the locals uh, surrounding and uh, have at least 21 jobs available, drivers, counselors, ministers, transporters, uh, interns, uh, funeral directors, the funeral home itself has a lot of jobs available. And the longer you're open, the more jobs that uh, can produce in that community. Um, Ms. Tawana has said a lot of things, and, and I'm sure that I'm, I, my time is not going to be used as going back and forth with her. Um, give me the opportunity to open the funeral home. Uh, it is an essential part of anyone's community. And it, I do know that had I been open a year ago, this is a business that uh, could have remained open during this pandemic and could have supplied jobs. It would have remained open and it could have supported the community during this time. And so, um, you know, this is that type of business. It, it's, it's not a business that can be closed down by uh, government. It's, it's the type of business that can only support the community and government. And so um, I've been here, I've been supporting um, the, the, the county, I've been supporting the city. Um, I'm honored to do that. And uh, uh, one community cannot have enough services. Um, you know, yes, there are community, uh, there's a community building uh, half a block up but that community business, that community business, uh, building is not open 24 seven. A funeral home is open 24 seven for someone in need. And so um, I, I thank everybody for their support, not to mention there is uh, a building on 24th street right now with a, a building full of supporters. So I wanna thank everyone at the Prince Hall building. Um, there, there was people that could not speak, could not get connected. Frederick Jacobs uh, could not get connected. He was registered to vote today. And also uh, Camila Shabazz was registered to vote and something happened. And I wanna thank everybody that was registered to vote and could not get on and thank all of the supporters. Um, so I, I did hear that there was 100 and then 200. And uh, I, I do know that I myself have went door to door, have had campaign, mailbox campaigns, and have had several neighborhood meetings and opened it up to the community, mayor and council members. And they are never from the opposing side, more than 10 or 12 people at any time and when those 10 or 12 people come, they always change their mind. So I thank you so very much for the extra time and I'm, I'm hoping that you will support this project. The city received uh, today or on the council agenda packet, three comments in opposition and two in support. Councilwoman Pastor. Ellen. Um, this overlay was passed in 1999. Am I correct or correct me if I'm wrong? Uh, Mayor Councilman Pastor, it was passed in uh, either 1999 or 2000, very early uh, time, late 99, early 2000. Okay. And is this, this isn't target B, correct? Or... Mayor Councilman Pastor, uh, it is a uh, an area within uh, target area B, which is a redevelopment okay. area that is is much larger, um, and so it's still a part of that that redevelopment plan. This is consistent with that plan. The zoning overlay is something that is different, and that just deals with the the commercial properties that are fronting along Broadway Road and kind of both east and west of 24th Street. There's a separate overlay for South Phoenix Village and Target Area B that deals with some design standards for residential, but this property is not within that area. 
Okay, so it, yeah, it, it's not in that area, but it, it is uh, close to target B because I was I knew intimately target B. Um, and so that's why I was asking those questions. The, the second question is um, regarding overlays. Since it's 19 years, I think, 19 years, um, my question is that in overlays, how do they get uh, revised or re-looked at, reanalyzed in today's uh, moment or, or society, uh, what we're living in today? What is that process? So, Mayor, uh, Council Members, uh, and Councilman Pastor, uh, the, the overlay process is one that's very time intensive uh, from a staff perspective because you have to work with all of the, the property owners who own the land as well as uh, the larger community and what they would like to see. And so uh, it's done via a staff effort in working with the community. Uh, we have not uh, undertaken any overlays or significant planning efforts like this uh, in quite some time because we just don't have the resources back when the department used to, to do some of these larger efforts, we had you know one village planner for each area, and then they would take on some of these additional you know projects. Where currently we have uh, two and and uh, three villages that are staffed by one you know village planner, so they don't have the the additional resources uh, to really go through and go through a significant effort, and so that's. That's been a challenge in trying to uh, address some of these older ones and some concerns about uh, you know what could happen in trying to modernize them. Okay, but there is the possibility to for that request if it's requested by the community or um, what by the community to let's let's look at the overlay or the village. So. Mayor, uh, Councilwoman Pastor, uh, there would be, uh, if there was a request from uh, the council to, to do that, staff would try and fit that into uh, you know, our work program, but it is uh, something we'd try and do and help uh, to make happen, but there, there is some uh, you know, resource issues there, and I wanna be upfront and honest about that so that everyone understands right. uh, we're happy to try and help, but we just don't have a, a significant amount of resources to do those things. Okay, and then uh, my third question is regarding the mortuary in the past. Um, I'm not sure if you know the history of uh, why it was denied in the past, or could you explain um, some of the history? Uh, Mayor, Councilwoman Pastor, um, it's my understanding from, uh, I've heard from Councilman Johnson, who obviously represented that area, uh, that in the past there was a, um, a proposed mortuary uh, in that area. I don't know that it ever came forward uh, with a vote. What I had heard was that that parcel ended up being purchased uh, by the city and there was community concerns about the, the mortuary. I don't know if, if uh, you know, that was, was what happened in terms of, of, of that property being purchased. Uh, the bulk of that land was uh, purchased through federal monies uh, under CDBG grants to eliminate slum and blight. So it wouldn't have been something that the city would have been able to use that money to buy a parcel because they didn't want some other type of use. It would have been used uh, to eliminate a, a parcel that had some slum and blight effects on the community, of which there were a number of them in that area, hence the, the overlays and, and the Community Excellence Project and others working for a number of years to try and revitalize that area. Okay, thank you. Um, I know that area really well. Uh, I worked uh, I worked all over the place, Phoenix, but uh, especially in that area, I worked at South Mountain Community College and um, know that street know all those streets very well in the sense of um, moving, coming and going. And uh, I worked very closely at the time with Keys Community Center. Uh, Keys Community Center is no longer there. And as when they left, it's just been um, a building that people have come in, come out, come in, come out. And uh, there's never been any type of 
civilization, I guess is what I want to try to say, and uh, consistency uh, with the building. Um, and so I understand uh, both sides and, and can see both sides, uh, but I will be supporting the councilman uh, on this uh, item. Mayor? Councilman DeCicio. Just a quick question, Alan, too. Are these overlays even legal anymore? Uh, Mayor, uh, Councilman uh, DeCicio, uh, they are legal. The city has the authority to do a zoning overlay. However, because of Proposition 207 uh, that went into effect, the overlay is something that um, you wouldn't be able to uh, reduce uses that a property owner uh, had unless that property owner consented to that reduction. And so we can still do them, but they are, are more additive than, uh, than restrictive. And so uh, if you look at the Four Corners overlay, what was done with that was taking out some uses to restrict them to do more what the community wanted than what C2 zoning districts allow throughout the rest of the city. And uh, a brand new start from scratch overlay like that would be uh, something that the city could not do unless each of those property owners signed a Prop 207 waiver. However, we could go back in and, and, and update that because what is there and, and restrictive today was on the books prior to, to that law. So anything that we'd be looking at doing would have to be making it easier for folks to develop in that particular uh, area to entice some additional private investment uh, to try and, and make happen what the community has long desired to happen. And Mayor, just a couple more questions on that because actually I helped draft 207 uh, quite a few years ago on this. So you can no, you cannot even diminish anyone's property value, correct, Alan? I mean, just to be clear on that. So if the zoning of category of C2 allows X, and I am pretty sure even carrying it forward, if you had a past overlay, you cannot still diminish the property values going forward. So if they've got a C2 on there and an overlay, how do you diminish someone's property values at that point? Especially if they're, you said trade-offs, you can't do trade-offs in zoning. Under 207 for sure. So Mayor Councilman DeCicio, um, uh, the, the overlay process would be one that you'd be working with the, those property owners to, to have discussions about that to the, the, from the standpoint of maybe are there some uses they don't care about, but maybe they would uh, like to have uh, you know, additional uh, level of building height, for example, or something like that, that would be a trade-off as part of, of an overlay. But in, in general, you wouldn't be able to uh, impose an overlay on someone's private property that diminished their value without them signing a, a waiver uh, saying they were okay with, with that um, you know, process. And that is what it has inhibited a number of, of community folks who have wanted to do overlays since that time to address some of these issues is that under state law, uh, you cannot do it unless that property owner is willing to consent to, to the change. I get that part. So did the property owner ever consent to giving up their rights prior to 207? I'm guessing not, correct? Well, Councilman uh, DeCicio Mayor, I, I don't believe that you can make the law retroactively apply uh, to uh, a council action that took place in 2000 when the uh, Prop 207, as I recall, wasn't passed until 2006, 2007. So. I don't think you can go mm -hmm. back in time and, and, and make that claim, but you know, there's lots of attorneys who will, will but, make lots of claims. Right, exactly. But at least from my perspective, uh, 207 was written so that people's property rights would be enacted, or not enacted, intact from what they were allowed to do. The overlays were pretty much universally taken out of that. And that's something even the city of Phoenix, we've talked about, you're talking about going forward. I'm talking about actions going back for backward. These overlays that are already over properties, whether it's this one or others, they're not, I, I don't believe that they're legal, but I'm not an attorney. That's something that would have to be argued in court. I'm just even wondering why she would 
if that was the case, why she even needs to be here today? Because these overlays, as far as I'm concerned, are not even legal, even retrospectively. So that's just more of a statement. You don't need to answer that, Alan. But I believe 207 was written that way so that if you're in a, a zoning category, those were your rights and they were granted to you, irrespective of, uh, you know, a, an overlay saying you're, you can't have certain rights to that zoning category when everyone else has those. So that's just more of a comment. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Roll call. DeCicio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Williams? No. Guardado? Mayor, I want to explain my vote? Please. So I, I just wanted to say um, that I know that Council Member Garcia has been hearing about this case ever for the last year, ever since that, that he's been in office. I know that he has done a lot, a lot of different meetings, talked to a lot of neighborhood neighborhood leaders, different neighborhoods, different people, and I know that this is not this is not an easy decision. These cases are always hard um, hard to vote on, um, but today I'm going to be voting yes on this. Thank you. Gallego. No. Passes seven to two. next move to item 84 and 85 which are related cases we will have one uh, staff report and public hearing and then we will have separate motions i will turn to councilwoman williams uh, who represents the area to introduce the staff report if you would like a staff report uh, we have no one on the phone to provide comments yes, at the moment yes. Okay, I'll give a quick uh, review. Mayor, members, uh, council, uh, I, this is Alan Stevenson. I'll do a, a quick uh, PowerPoint here that covers item 84 and 85. Then you can take public testimony on, uh, obviously, on both of those and then separate motions. So item 84 is the general plan amendment uh, for the southwest corner of I-17 and Dixaletta Drive. Item 85 is the related zoning case uh, for it as well. Um, the uh, request is opposite the southwest corner of I-17 and Dixletter Drive. On the aerial, you see the, the area to be changed, uh, which is in green for the general plan amendment, and the zoning case uh, is just the more immediate corner of the southwest corner of Dixletta and I-17, but also includes the hill uh, to the west of it. Uh, in this case, the general plan is a mixed-use designation of various uh, elements and they are going to residential 3.5 to 5 dwelling units an acre and removing the infrastructure phasing overlay to allow development on this parcel on the west side of I-17 here. It's 64.84 uh, acres. Staff does recommend approval per the Planning Commission. It is residential 3.5 to, to 5 dwelling units an acre for Lennar Homes to do a residential uh, development. Uh, the zoning case that goes with this uh, is uh, C2, R3A, and R118 to R16 and R118 for that uh, proposed Lennar single family home uh, development. There is a, um, a memo that came out yesterday that had some revised uh, stipulations. Staff does recommend approval per that memo. You can see on this aerial, the C2 uh, shown on this map is the area that's going to the um, R16 uh, residential for development. And then this area that is the hillside back to the west is an area that the applicant is dedicating as part of this zoning uh, case to the Parks Department for inclusion as part of the Sonoran Preserve. And that is something that uh, Councilwoman Williams, uh, the Parks Department, and, and Planning Development Department and Lennar Homes have been working on for uh, quite some time. And so the additional stipulations are to incorporate some of the items that Parks wanted as part of that donation. 
Here's the proposed site plan to show uh, single family residential and what it would look like along that corridor. Uh, staff does recommend approval of the general plan amendment per the planning commission recommendation and the new stipulations from the, the memo from myself dated yesterday. In those new uh, stipulations, there's three additional ones about access to that preserve area um, and a disclosure uh, and requirements for the owners who will live there in the future to go use uh, the trailheads that will be constructed and not walk in through their neighborhood into the, the preserve areas. With that, staff's happy to answer any questions. Any questions from council? We will open the public hearing. We have Bill Lawley representing the applicant. Uh, from Tiffany and Bosco. Mayor, members of the council, this is Ashley Marsh from Tiffany and Bosco, uh, 2525 East Camelback Road for your record. Uh, Mr. Stevenson did a great job summarizing our request. Lenar Homes is very excited uh, to be bringing this community online and as part of that to be down donating the Middle Vista Mountain, a 120 uh, acre hillside donation. Um, we've incorporated that into the zoning request so that that mountain can be donated. Uh, this is a, a down zoning from commercial to residential. Um, and we're very excited to have worked with staff. Thank them uh, very much, Mr. Stevenson and his team and the park team to work out stipulations that met everyone's needs. Um, we're happy to answer any questions um, at this time. And, and again, thank staff for their hard work on this case. Thank you. We will close the public hearing and I will turn to Councilwoman Williams for comments and a motion on first 84. Well, thank you, Mayor. I want to thank uh, the developers, the staff, everyone involved. We've been working on this for quite a while. It's very important that we continue to get uh, the hillsides donated. Um, I am very excited about this. The, the number of units, number is lower than what it was before. I think it's going to be excellent. So I move to approve uh, for the planning commission's approval and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Awesome. Mayor and Council, I would just clarify for the record that for the general plan, it's a related resolution. Uh, the zoning case has the ordinance attached. Thank you. Any council member comments? Is that what I said? Exactly. Adopt the rated. So we will be voting on Councilman Williams' motion to approve and adopt the related resolution. Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. That says nine zero. We next move to item 85, a related case. Councilwoman Williams. Thank you, Mayor. I. <clears throat> Now, when you may have to read that motion that says for the, plan, the memo for the planning department, planning director uh, for the three additional stipulations, but I basically am moving to approve the planning hearing officer's motion to approve the commission and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Mayor Council, I'll just clarify for, for the record, it is to uh, motion to approve it per the memo from the Planning Development Department Director dated June 23rd, 2020, and adopt the related ordinance, and that covers those three stipulations that I briefly summarized into the record uh, are spelled out in detail in that memo, and so that'll take care of the, the legal paperwork side of it in, in that approval. Thank you very much. Any comments? Roll call. Decisio. Yes. Garcia. 
Yes. Nowakowski. Yes. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Williams. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 9-0. We next move to item 86, an item in the vice mayor's district. We'll turn it over to the vice mayor to introduce the item. Perfect. Um, so I would first like to start um, a report from, from staff on, the, on this item, just to introduce um, the item for us, please. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Vice Mayor. These two items are a related general plan amendment and zoning case that can be uh, heard and presented together and testimony taken. We'll just need separate actions like the, the last case that we just had. Uh, item 86 is a general plan amendment for the northwest and northeast corners of Ballpark Boulevard and Camelback Road and the northwest corner of 107th Avenue and Camelback. The uh, zoning case that's for a smaller uh, subset of that general plan area is approximately 315 feet west of the northwest corner of Ballpark Boulevard and Camelback Road. Uh, this aerial shows uh, the area, the zoning case is in blue. The larger general plan uh, area is the purple and the blue area shown on, uh, on this aerial. Uh, the inset of that is uh, the uh, Ballpark Spring Training Facility uh, that is around uh, in this area. Um, the uh, general plan amendment request is from uh, publicly owned open space and residential 3.5 to 5 dwelling units per acre, residential 10 to 15 dwelling units per acre, and mixed use. The acreage is almost 81 acres. Staff does recommend approval per the uh, Planning Commission recommendation. Uh, this is what the current general plan looks like. At one point, uh, this uh, subject site in the immediate corner is land that was owned by the, the city of Phoenix and was planned for a park. Uh, however, that uh, park facility was built just down the road on the southeast corner of 107th Avenue in Camelback. And so uh, this land uh, has being, is being sold by the city of Phoenix. It's part of that surplus uh, you know, land that the city has been uh, going through and, and working to find uh, buyers for the last few years. Uh, so it does go uh, residential 10 to 15 dwelling units per acre, uh, and then the pink color is mixed use for the, the remainder of the area. The related zoning case goes from S1 special permit S1 to R2. It's an 18 acre site. It is multifamily residential. Uh, staff does recommend approval per the memo uh, dated June 22nd, 2020 uh, from staff. Uh, here's the uh, blow up of the area for the rezoning request. And so you can see that uh, to the south is R16 uh, and R2 residential uh, zoning as well. Uh, the proposed project is a apartment project that is one of the newer style of apartment projects that looks like uh, single family homes that are you know, attached together. And, uh, but they, it is a product that there are a number of them that have been built and are under construction throughout the valley, but they are for rent uh, units. Uh, here's the uh, elevations of what they look like for this particular project. Uh, staff does recommend approval for the Planning Commission recommendation and approve of the, the zoning case for the memo dated June 22nd, 2020, with the additional uh, stipulation that clarified the, uh, the open space as it relates to uh, the project. And with that, staff's happy to answer any questions. Uh, I would note for the record that this one uh, was uh, denied by the Mary Village Planning Committee, but approved by the Planning Commission. And with that, we're happy, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, any questions for Alan? All right, we will go ahead and open the public hearing. Uh, we'll begin, but with uh, Jordan Rose. <laughs> Yes, this is Jordan Rose. Thank you, it's Jordan Rose from Rose Law Group on behalf of Empire Group and um, also the City of Phoenix and the City of Glendale in this application. I just wanted to briefly 
and um, wholeheartedly thank the vice mayor. Um, she worked so hard on behalf of the community um, with us and not only with us, but with, with the community members and even through, I know you had your staff out on weekends talking to people just to come up with the best plan for a future vibrant development at this important um, area uh, to fulfill the visions of the ballpark and that the city had for mixed use development around Camelback Ranch so long ago. And I just thank you for all the effort that you put into this. Um, I have a full presentation, but in the interest of time, I would um, save my time for just any questions. Thank you so much. Mayor? Vice Mayor. So, um, so Jordan, I have a couple, uh, I have a question for you. So I, I know that um, since the planning, since the planning commission, since the other votes um, that happened, I know that you and I have been working together and trying to find resolution to a lot of the concerns that people had had at, had at the village. And I wanted to know what is the progress that you have that your client has made um, with with the community leaders um, in addressing those concerns. Appreciate it. Um, I think uh, two of the most important things um, that that happened um, since the village, uh, after you assembled the community groups with us, is you came up with a way for the money that the ball teams will pay to the city for that land um, to go directly to open space in District Five, and um, be reserved for any kind of public open space. In addition to that, which was really important, is we added perimeter trails to connect to the Aquafia Wash and a nearly unprecedented pedestrian trail through our residential community that will be open to pedestrians for the public. And so those um, things uh, we did um, in, a, in an effort to uh, work with community members' concerns and we appreciated your leadership on that. Perfect, thank you. Thank you. Uh, next will be Maggie Shrek, followed by John Cadis. Uh, Hello. Oh, you can hear me now. Wonderful. Good afternoon, Mayor, City Council members. My name is Maggie Shrek, and I would like to speak in regards to item 86 on the agenda. Um, we under, from what we're hearing now, apparently there were communications regarding this development and these zoning requests. However, we understand that the developer and representatives had in-person meetings that no one attended. The Maryville City Planning Commission voted unanimously against this development. For me personally, I could care less what happens west of the ballpark. But the property that adjoins 107th Avenue has been fought over for years in order to protect this neighborhood. Now, during the PowerPoint presentation, they did show the, the neighborhoods that were south and, and east of Ballpark Boulevard, but they didn't show the neighborhood that's north. This is a small neighborhood, one road in, one road out. Are you experienced extreme issues because of the ballpark. During spring training, if someone in this neighborhood has a medical emergency, they're gonna die. The traffic is off the chart and no one has addressed any of those issues. So we would like the city council to vote against this zoning change, bring it back after the neighbors can be involved because they have not been involved and this does not follow the applicable law that requires neighborhood involvement in, in meetings. This all occurred while the entire state was under COVID-19 lockdown. So I don't believe it's legal. Thank you very much for hearing me. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Cadis is not wishing to speak, so we will have Bonnie Conrad followed by Thomas Galvin.
Bonnie, the floor is yours. Hello? Hello. Hi, this is Bonnie Conrad. Um, I'm a member, I'm a resident of the Thoroughbred Farms neighborhood, which is north of Camelback, east of 107th, right across from the property that they want to rezone as mixed use, which I am totally against. I That's just that section with the 107th Avenue and Camelback Northwest corner. That is the entrance to our neighborhood, the only way in and out. And I would be totally against mixed use with the idea of hotels, uh, restaurants, bars, whatever would go in there would no way be, as they state, sensitive to the scale and character of the surrounding neighborhood or incorporate to prevent negative impacts on our residential property. Our neighborhood is all uh, horse properties with large irrigated lots. It is a quiet agricultural community. I'm totally against any type of, of business being put on that corner. And that is my main dissent about the, re or the general plan amendment um, because I don't want to see that corner change to mixed use. Maryville Village voted 12 to 0 against it. Why have village committees if the other committees aren't going to listen to them? Uh, mixed use, a change of, to mixed use at this time just gives a developer a foot in the door to build what is not wanted. So if they remove the mixed use from the northwest corner of 107th and Camelback, I would be happier about that. They want uh, more type of mixed use over by the ballpark, which is at Ballpark Avenue. Stay over there with their mixed use and don't build stuff like that at our neighborhood end. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker will be Mr. Galvin. Mayor, it appears he is not on the line. All right. We will close the public hearing and I will turn to the vice mayor. Yes, yeah, so thank you, Mayor. I just have a couple questions for you, Ellen, and I don't know if Inger, I don't know if you, I don't know if Inger's around or maybe you can answer these questions. I know that in the sale of this parcel or in the sale of this piece of land, I just, I just want to put it on the record um, that the money that we get out of the sale is going to stay in, in District 5 and the West Side. Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, I have uh, had a discussion with uh, Inger Erickson, the Parks and Recreation Department uh, Director, and she did confirm that yes, it would stay within uh, you know the District 5 area. And then my second question, I know that we're getting a lot, a lot of comments um, when it comes to new mixed use. Can you just tell us a little bit what's the process that we would do with community um, if the ballpark came back to us and said we want to build a hotel or retail or restaurants. Can you just explain to us what would be the process that we would use um, to engage community um, in this process? Yes, uh, Mayor, Vice Mayor, that's a, it's a great question. Uh, I did put up the, the aerial here to help explain that. And so, uh, in this particular instance, the um, zoning case uh, only covers the immediate area of the south, um, you know, west air corner of Ballpark Boulevard and Camelback Road. So that's the area of the zoning case. That is the one that legally establishes the ability to, to do uses. The other area in purple that goes over to 107th Avenue and Camelback um, is just a general plan amendment change, and it does not come with it any uh, land use entitlements and zoning to do the mixed use. Uh, currently, that the properties are zoned a mix of S1 and the S1 special permit that allows for the, the ball fields to be there and the accessory uses that are, are part of a ball field. 
it wouldn't allow for a mixed use uh, you know, type of development. So that would be a future zoning case that would have to come forward uh, to rezone the areas that are shown in purple to allow that mixed use to happen. As part of that rezoning request, there would be a notice required to all property owners within 600 feet of the surrounding boundaries. Any neighborhood associations that are registered with the city within a mile, the properties would get posted with big four foot by eight foot signs saying rezoning, hearing, uh, and it would go back through all of the, the steps that it just went through uh, as part of this process with the Maryville Village Planning Committee uh, after they have to have a couple of, of neighborhood meetings, then the, the village, then the planning commission, and then ultimately the city council to make the final decision. Perfect, thank, thank you so much. Um, so, so with that, I, I just wanna thank everyone that has been part of, part of this project. I wanna thank all, everyone's input from our different community leaders, from our planning commission, from our Maryville Village. I think everyone voiced their concerns. Um, I wanna thank um, Jordan um, for addressing a lot of these concerns. I think everyone um, in District 5 um, has seen me, um, has, that has spoken to me, um, knows that I will always take um, community input very seriously and we will always let our different community leaders lead the charge in terms of what needs to happen in the district and what are some of the changes that they, that they would like to see happen. And I am 100% committed to that, committed to that and making sure that we let community continue to drive the conversation and making sure that we can actually um, be able to meet in the middle and bring in good development, but at the same time, continue to work on open spaces and engagement um, with our different community leaders. So with that, I would like to make the motion to approve per the Planning Commission's approval on June 4th, 2020 and adopt the related the related resolution. Second. Okay. Any council member comments? <laughs> Roll call. Mayor Silva. Councilwoman Williams. I have a potential conflict on these two items and will not participate. Thank you, Councilwoman. Roll call. Desicio. Yes. Garcia. Yes. Nowakowski. I have a comment. Um, Mayor, I just want to thank the Vice Mayor for find, trying to find that happy ground and find, find a win-win in the situation, and I'll be voting a yes on this. Pastor. Yes. Stark. Yes. Waring. Yes. Guardado. Yes. Gallego. Yes. Passes 8-0. Congratulations, Vice Mayor. We next move to item 87. Do you have a motion? Yes, I have a motion to approve further planning commission's approval on June 4th, 2020 and adopt the related ordinance. Second. Mayor, members of council, if I could just clarify uh, that one for the record, it would be a motion to approve per the memo from the planning and development director dated June 22nd, 2020, and then adopt the related ordinance. Uh, Vice Mayor, I could not yes. hear you. Are you comfortable for the planning director? Yes, I, yes, I am definitely comfortable with that. Yes. I, I thought you might be. And I'm sorry, did we have a second? <laughs> sorry. Yes. yes, Mayor. I second it. That's right. Councilman Stark had seconded. Uh, any council member comments? Roll call. Decisio? Yes. Garcia? Yes. Nowakowski? Yes. Pastor? Yes. Stark? Yes. Waring? Yes. Guardado? Yes. Gallego? Yes. 
passes 8-0. That concludes our agendized business for today's formal city council meeting. We will next turn to public comment. We have eight members of the public wishing to address the council. Uh, we will turn to our city attorney to introduce uh, and explain the logistics of public comment. Mayor, Mayor, this is the city manager. If I might, just in order to um, finish one bit of business that was a request from Councilman DeCicio, uh, about some information on the community legal services. Ms. Franklin does have that information as we promised to get during this meeting, if we might. Please. Uh, thank you, City Manager Zerker. Mayor Gallego and Councilman DeCicio, to answer your question, we did go back and, and take a look. It is not based upon an hourly rate, and this is relative to your question regarding community and legal services. It is a flat rate. Those attorneys that are referenced in the, I think you referenced the attorneys and what they would be doing, would be based uh, at those eight or nine um, Phoenix-based justice courts working 40 hours a week. Our tracking mechanism for them will be reports that need to come back to us on a monthly basis indicating the number of clients that are served and the types of services that are provided. But to answer your question, no, it is not based upon an hourly rate. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Uh, it's a little unusual, but that's fine. I got the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Director Frank Franklin and Councilman DeCicio. Chris? Could we turn to our city attorney to introduce public citizen comment? Thank you, Mayor. During citizen comment, members of the public may address the City Council for up to three minutes on issues of interest or concern to them. The Arizona Open Meeting Law permits the City Council to listen to the comments, but prohibits Council members from discussing or acting on the matters presented. Thank you. We will begin with Luis Herrera, followed by Suzanne Steinberg. A little bit staticky, uh, but we can hear you. Uh, can you guys hear me? Much better now. Uh, so, uh, my name is Bash, and I'm a member of uh, Unite Here Local 11. Um, I work at the convention center downtown, and you know we uh, welcome people from all over the world that come to visit us. Um, and three months ago, I got laid off, so. I kind of just want to share about my experiences since then. Um, so it's been pretty stressful for me since I've gotten laid off. Um, I had to find another job because, you know, I still got my rent. to pay so I have all my bills to pay and um yeah and you know there's so many people there that are literally transferred there's nothing with what touch and you know especially when we shift change like people and the whole their entire priority is just how much money can we make how much can we produce and it's not you know how can we keep our workers safe you know after there's already been like 15 cases but i mean there's already been more than that i already lost count of how many cases there's been and you know, when we open the center, I'm just, I don't want to step in that convention. I don't want to be my friends, you know, I don't, people dying. a lot of people are dying, and I don't want my friends to, like, have to get sick. People have to worry about, you know, not having enough time to, like, go on their breaks so that they can, like, 
you know, their hands and it's, it's, I just don't want to see this happen at the convention center when I go back. And, you know, I'm worried about myself, but, you know, I'm also just worried about my coworkers and about, you know, their family. families and if they end up getting them sick so you know I, I just, people are surprised that we haven't seen anything to do something to help these people and we need it and i, I want to make sure that when i go back that people are actually taking care of and there's guidelines in place that people are safe and not worry about dying like this is this should be the number one priority for to take care of our workers make sure that we don't have to worry about getting sick so i ask that the city council pass an ordinance and to protect and support the hospitality and food service workers and set an example for the rest of the country because this needs to be the number one priority people are dying and people deserve to get taken care of people don't shouldn't be losing their jobs people shouldn't be losing their health care and so we I, we need to see something change otherwise like all of you guys Thank are you. Not come election day Suzanne will be followed by Lucia Salinas. Am I doing it? Oh, hello? Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Mayor, I'm sorry, is, is that an issue on our side or is that an issue with them that we just can't hear anything? Well, I heard her say, can you hear me? And then I didn't hear her say anything after that, so I do not know. Okay, I'm trying to figure out, can you hear me now? Now we can hear you. Okay, I think I'm just pushing the button or something, I'm sorry. Um, so you can still hear me, right? Yes, we can. Okay, so I have one, um, one thing is about the street names, I know you guys are going to talk about it next time. I wanted to ask to consider Indian School Road and Indian School Park as also derogatory terms um, and to consider the those street names to be changed and that park name to be changed. Um, I also wanted to ask for a new code. Right now we have a code for railings. If you have a railing or you don't have a railing, and um, I wanted to ask for an additional code for if the railing is extremely loose to, cause there are a lot of extremely loose, loose railings. Sometimes you need a uh, railing to be loose and forgive, but sometimes it's loose due to the, the rot, the wood rot. And so I also sent something to the council members um, about the street names and the additional, um, uh, the additional code for railings. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about is like, um, my mom has a, an extreme mental health disability and right now there's no programs for children who have parents who are part, become part of the mental health care system at a very young age. Um, and I don't know how you would begin that funding, but if that's something um, connecting with a nonprofit to make sure that population of people is being heard because they're also the voiceless. And then as another thing, um, I recently, there's a lot of people who have mental health disabilities that are dying due to their disability that is a preventable death, but there's a misunderstanding about disability rights because of the history of disabilities. Usually it's about more independence versus less. So to look into educating the public about um, the difference in the range of mental health disabilities. Um, and that was it. Mayor, this is the city clerk. I just wanted to confirm that we have received in the city clerk's office two citizen petition requests from Suzanne Steinberg related to the change of street names was one of them and related to the railings was the second one. Thank you. Uh, we will next go to Lucia followed by Maricela Maris. Lucia, floor is yours. Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me guys? Yes. Yes, we can. Oh, okay. Um, my name is Lucia Salinas. Um, I work with HMS Hose. Um, 
I think I've been talking too much in the city of Phoenix, but um, we be I've been with the company for 18 years, and now um, like they're already starting to open our restaurants. I don't have a choice to go back, um, but um, we're still concerned and. I'm still afraid to go back more because I've been talking to coworkers. Actually, they've been calling me that uh, one coworker on Terminal 4 is a bartender. He got the positive, uh, positive COVID-19. So he got um, the coronavirus. So, and he's a worker from HMS Hose. Um, and I'm afraid to go back actually. And, but I don't have another choice to go back because I need my insurance. Um, are you guys hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yes, we hear you. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so, so it's very afraiding to go back with, uh, to the airport. Um, but I don't have like a choice. We don't have choice to just go back and work because we need our insurance. Uh, I need my insurance. I, I am, I'm an illness person that, I, but also like, I'm afraid because if I go back, I'm more easier to get the COVID-19. And I know I'm not the only one uh, with, with health problems. Also, there's others where right now, few of them already start starting working. And on top of that, they're like, um, working with, the environment, uh, they're not making hours either. Um, so they're risking also their health and for a little bit hours. So they're not even making a lot of money either to pay their mortgage or their bills. And they cannot apply for an appointment because if they're making 240, it's a lot already. So I don't, we actually, we need your guys' help. What you, how you guys can help us I mean, we're the city of Phoenix. We work for the city of Phoenix. The airport, because of us, the airport runs. Like, it's very sad to to find out that coworkers are getting sick. And I'm afraid to go back. Thank you. Thank you. Maricela will be followed by Mari Yepes. Hi, hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, <clears throat> my name is Marisela. I live in District 8, and I'm a proud member of Unite Here Local 11. Um, like many people have been saying, um, myself and others in the hospitality industry are being put in a really impossible um, decision right now between going back to work and risking our lives or staying home and losing our health benefits, running out of unemployment benefits, um, you know, and we really need the support of the city of Phoenix to pass an ordinance to protect us. You know, it's not, it's not just that our state, our city is being profits over people's lives. You know, people, you know, pe members of my, of my community, um, coworkers, people that I know from the industry are getting sick. You know, as a hospitality worker, we're on the front lines, right? And it is completely up to, you know, it's completely in your control to do something about it. And I really urge you to consider passing an ordinance so that, you know, we have the per the proper protective gear so that we can get better sick um, hours in case we do get sick. Um, and then overall, just that we have a job to go back to once it's safe to go back to work. Um, it's not fair that people should be fired because they're fearing for their life, you know, for going to work and getting coronavirus. That's not fair. It's incredibly cruel. And, um, you know, we're really looking to you all to be leaders and actually do something about this. Thank you. Thank you. Mari will be followed by Michelle. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, Mayor Gallego and Vice Mayor Guardado and members of the City Council. My name is Mari Yepes. 
I'm a former hotel worker and I now work as an organizer with the Hospitality Workers Union Unite Here Local 11. I am speaking on the importance of passing measures to protect workers in the hospitality industry. Currently, due to COVID-19, thousands of tourism workers have been laid off or terminated. Those that are laid off live with uncertainty, not knowing if they will be able to return to their jobs. Those that are ter terminated are left without anything. I spoke with few people who worked at the Arizona Grand. Some of them have worked there for over 20 years, and they were all terminated as of May 15th. Tourism workers didn't cause this pandemic. The tourism industry will recover. Those workers who built the Phoenix hospitality industry should be able to return to their jobs. Now, as our state government reopened, Arizona hospitality workers are faced with more uncertainty. After speaking with hundreds of hotel workers across the valley, I know that they are, they are worried and are scared, as you've heard from some people today, about what happens if they fall sick at work. Many hospitality workers use all their pay time off to offset their income loss when they were laid off or furloughed. Workers should not have to worry about how to take time off if they contract this serious virus. Not surprisingly, as a state where COVID cases are skyrocketing, hospitality workers are getting sick. In the Point Hilton Squat Peak, two housekeepers have tested positive for COVID and a third awaits the result of her test. Hotels and other hospitality venues are not yet equipped with proper training to ensure that workers and guests are safe. Workers need additional time in the workday to follow safety protocols to slow the spread of the virus, and workers need training and equipment to follow new safety protocols. This council has an opportunity to protect the jobs, the health, and the safety of hospitality workers. Please pass the Phoenix Healthy Hospitality and Tourism Measures so that Phoenix can remain the premier destination that hospitality workers have built. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle will be followed by Lacey. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Awesome. Uh, my name is Michelle Hornstein and I work as a server in Sky Harbor Airport. I'm a member of Unite Here Local 11 and I have worked uh, for SSP America for over five years. I feel that it's my duty today to speak with you because I know that my safety and that of my family and the general public are at risk. I want to thank you for taking steps to ensure face masks are worn by all as we see huge spikes in COVID cases here in the Valley. Thank you to Councilman Garcia, Councilwoman Pastor, Vice Mayor Guardado, and Councilman Nowakowski for setting up meetings with my coworkers and myself, pledging to do everything you can to protect hospitality workers. Mayor Gallego, after many emails and phone calls, I am very happy to say that I finally heard back from your assistant today, and we are all looking forward to meeting with you as soon as possible to discuss putting measures in place to protect us. The restaurants in the airport are beginning to reopen when we have been dubbed a new epicenter for this virus. This is not only dangerous, but it is also very telling of just how little our companies value our health and safety. We are seeing thousands of new cases each day, and it is glaringly clear that Arizona does not have this surge under control. I am being asked to go back to work and expose myself to this virus and then return home to my three-year-old daughter. I'm curious why more value is being placed on large corporations and not on the lives of those of us who are the heartbeat of an industry which generates billions of dollars for your city each year. What about the lives of all the passengers, too? When the public hears that the airport is a COVID-19 hotspot, everybody's financial stability will be in jeopardy yet again. Just last week, a bartender for host tested positive with COVID-19. I'm speaking to all of you, but I know some of you never actually listen to the voice of the people, so I'm going to speak directly to you, Mayor Gallego. These companies are quite possibly sending us back into the airport to die. I do not want to be forced to choose between catching something that could kill me and my child or losing my home. Please don't forget about us. We are counting on you to do the right thing and pass an ordinance to keep hospitality workers safe. Thank you. Lacey will be followed by Obed. Hi. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. All right. Uh, my name is Lacey Ross, and I'm a snack bar attendant at Phoenix Sky Harbor Airport with HMS Hosts. I'm also a member of Unite Here Local 11. I've been committed to keeping the business running smoothly, and I've not been laid off any time during this pandemic. Me and my coworkers have weathered the storms and loss of hours, but, to but continue to come to work 
to serve the travelers of Phoenix to the best of our ability. I was recently exposed to COVID-19 at home and took two weeks to quarantine. I approached the human resources manager at HMS Host to ask for a continued furlough for the safety of both myself and those around me while the coronavirus cases spiked in Arizona and as more and more travelers start to come through the airport. I understand that HMS Host is doing what they're expected to do to keep the employees safe. Unfortunately, with the rise of traffic in Arizona and the airport and the rapid rise of COVID cases, these protocols are no longer efficient in ensuring that both employees and travelers can work and travel safely, and there should be more action and options available to ensure our safety. Already, there have been confirmed cases of COVID-19 amongst the HMS host employees at the airport. I was told that if I was not comfortable in working in the airport environment, that I should resign and that no restaurant in the airport would be able to accommodate the social distancing as recommended. HMS host has negligently forced me to return to work and are continuing to bring everybody else back without choice, despite the already positive cases in our airport to an environment where profit is clearly given priority over the safety of Sky Harbor employees and airport passengers. The city of Phoenix has been compliant in all of these actions. Or, yeah, as you continue to sit on the sidelines and vote to pass relief onto these companies. When and how will the city of Phoenix, the decision makers of the airport, decide our health is important too? The relaxed policy at the airport should concern us all. And this problem needs to be addressed immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker will be Obed. <clears throat> Hello. Oh, sorry. My name is Obed Cardin. I am a server at the Phoenix Scar Sky Harbor um, Airport with HMS Hertz. I am also a union member with Unite Here Local 11. I've been an employee who is on for low at the inception of this global pandemic. I've been fortunate enough to receive unemployment benefits, but due to policy, I have had my health benefits dropped. As someone who has had their mother, grandmother, and two other family members recovering from COVID-19 as we speak, I'm reaching out to you today with my concerns that the policy that HMS host is carrying out is negligent and irresponsible. At this time of overwhelming um, uncertainty, the assumption that HMS can continue to operate even with the given CDC regulations that have been implemented is exposing all employees to unethical business practices. Choosing to continue business without stringent, um, uh, comprehensive contact tracing, without mandatory quarantines Excuse me. After employees have had confirmed positive COVID-19 tests and mandatory self-isolation, oh, and without mandatory isolation of individuals who have come into contact with known COVID positive persons, put all HMS host staff and families health at risk. Furthermore, HMS host operates units in the airport whose small space renders social distancing and effective contingencies ineffective. Given the Phoenix Sky Harbor is a major transportation hub, it is imperative that the point of contact with the rest of the nation have higher standards than other private businesses, and not to do so would be irresponsible and detrimental to not only our state's public health, but the nation's as well. Though I have personally not been called back from fur furlough, I am aware that when that time comes, I have no choice but to participate in a reckless process that is putting lives in danger. The policy HMS hosts is enacting poses an ultimatum of work or resign, as if the circumstances and conditions employees agree to on their hire date are the same. I hope that the policy the state will pass reflects the public health is more important than building wealth. Thank you. Thank you. That is our final speaker for public comment. We are adjourned. <laughs>